Glidus is an absolute legend in the Game of Thrones YouTube niche. Known for his seamless blend of thoughtful analysis and sarcastic humour, Glidus has many fantastic analysis videos about the divisive show, often critical of its unfortunate dip in quality over time in his popular Piss Take series. But he gives credit where it's due, praising the show's highs and the fantastic adaptation and performances that made it such a sensation. As a musician himself, he also championed the TV show's iconic soundtrack. More recently, he has been very positive about the spin-off show House of the Dragon in his new Bliss Take series. Glidus has also made videos about the Song of Ice and Fire books that the TV show is based on often humorous in nature, poking fun at absurd fan theories that prop up within the community. In particular, implications that certain characters are actually horses. If you're wondering what a Game of Thrones YouTuber is doing on this podcast created by a Pokemon YouTuber, Glidus happens to be a fan of Pokemon, sometimes making surprise appearances in my comments and those of fellow Poketubers like Reverend. Thank you Glidus for agreeing to this odd crossover between niche YouTube communities today. And how are you? I'm doing swell today. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. And I gotta say I'm a fan of yours. I've been watching your videos for quite a long time, so it's an honor. Oh, that's nice to know. I've been watching your videos videos for quite a while as well. Well, thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's qu quite a strange crossover we've got here today, but we're, we've been aware of each other for some time. I'm hoping that most of my audience has at least watched Game of Thrones. It was the number one show on Earth, so this is not that crazy of a crossover, folks. First question for you is, what is the origin of the name Glidus? Oh, gosh. Um, so I had no idea what to call my channel because um, Jimothy Cool was already taken. Oh. <laughs> Um, so I was just going through, I liked, um, you know, I, I was obviously a big fan of Alt Shift X, who is the biggest channel in the Game of Thrones community, and today a collaborator of mine, which is a weird thing to think about, but, um, I liked how he had an abstract symbol for his, um, you know, iconography True. on YouTube. So I just looked, I, I was thinking about how else I, I could do, pull off the same thing. And I was looking into archaic names of symbols that you wouldn't use quite so often. So there's a pipe symbol on your keyboard if you um, hold shift and press backslash. That's the pipe. And an archaic name for that, or at least I found one. I don't know if it's true, but someone said that it used to be called a glidus, or at least was called a glidus at some point in history. So I took that. That's where the line comes from. And I added serifs to make it a little bit more interesting. It's still pretty boring, though. That's cool, in my opinion. I didn't know that was called something. I've just thought it like the stick is a little. It's got bar. a lot of names. I never thought about what that was called. Glidus makes it sound so mysterious and, and cool. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm glad you like it because um, I don't anymore. And <laughs> don't you? <laughs> well, I, I, I've everyone else has a more normal name that doesn't need a three minute long explanation. Well, it doesn't need to mean anything. It's just catchy. That's it's... true. And I think it says a lot about um, how, how much people appreciate my content that I've cultivated such a loyal audience while being a line. <laughs> it's an interesting identity, but but it works. So what got you into the, the world of Game of Thrones initially? Were you a show watcher that became a book reader or vice versa? I was the former. I refused to watch the show. I'm one of those guys who, you know, if you tell me to, to watch something, oh, you'll really like this. I, I, out of spite, refused to engage in it. So I didn't watch Game of Thrones for like five seasons. And then finally I caved in after the end of season five. And then I became, you know, totally enthralled in it. And I memorized the whole show um, before season six aired. And in that time, I was active on the Reddit and I was watching the, at the time, most popular YouTube creators there, which was still Alt Shift X, but a guy called Preston Jacobs, who had his crazy theories that I really liked. And I decided to emulate um, that sort of thing. But he wasn't a very good video editor, and I had a bit of video editing experience. So I was like, why not make crazier videos? You, you know, I'm a big a fan of the market. YouTube. Exactly. I'm a big fan of YouTube poops. And stuff like Brian David Gilbert, taste. Bill Wirtz. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I decided to sort of marry those two ideas. And that, those were my first few videos. And then the show came back, um, season eight aired, and I decided I needed to do something about it. And the only thing I could do was make silly little videos and people liked them, I guess. I had a similar experience with the show where I refused to watch it for a time while it was a cultural sensation. Got up to like, I think it was also season five. It might have been season four. And then I just binge watched watched it one day. I also got enthralled yeah. by it. It's very captivating. Yeah, and, and it was a big cultural phenomenon in that like it was great to talk to people while it was happening. Yeah. 
it's it's fun when there's big cultural events like that and everyone's watching the same thing. It doesn't happen yeah. too often anymore. I guess Dune has, has kind of had that recently, but... Yeah. Did you like the Dune movies, Jimothy Cool? I did. And when the first one came out, I... I read like half of the first book and got bored and then I watched the movie, loved it and went back to, to finish the book and then I went on and read the other ones. Right. So I I'm got really into Dune. Dune. Not all six. I, I stopped at God Emperor right. of Dune because it was getting a bit too crazy, to be honest. <laughs> but <laughs> Frank Herbert's kind of nuts, but yeah. he's got a unique mind. That's for sure. You a Dune fan? Um, I really liked the movies. Um, I actually haven't read as much as you seem to have, but I am... I've I've watched the Alt Shift X videos if that counts for anything. Oh, that's the same thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Who needs reading when you've got a, a bloke? Well, the books are a whole different. Happens. They're a whole different planet to the the movie. It's a good adaptation for sure, but there's a lot of detail and like insanity that's lost. The the movies really they make it seem like this epic saga, which it kind of is, but it's also it's very out there and strange, especially in the later yeah. books. Lots more musing on philosophy in the books. Yeah, and like weird alien creatures and the mechanics of the spice get crazy. Anyway, circling back to uh, to Game of Thrones and your channel, I feel like. Your first upload on YouTube was pretty high quality, so it, it gave me the sense that maybe you've had other channels before this and a bit of a history with the, with YouTube. Oh, wow. We're going way back. Um, yeah, Sickly Mockingbird. I guess, as I said, I had some experience editing. Oh, do I say what I... Yeah, okay, fine. I ran <laughs> a... <laughs> I ran a Let's Play channel for a couple of years. It doesn't exist anymore. You can't find it. I I dare you to try. Um, uh, so I had quite a bit of like just basic Premiere knowledge under my belt. And I'd been watching YouTube videos. And, you know, I, I watch with a critical eye. I try to like think about how the things I like got done. I'm a big fan of Dragon Ball Z abridged and Yu-Gi-Oh abridged. And I was really interested in the way that those editors took these old animes and made them into something new with the power of video editing and then the kaiser neko the director of dbza uploaded some breakdowns of how he did that and that was super useful for understanding how how to work magic in premiere like that oh cool yeah old youtube was a, is a very different world the yeah. way i got into editing was there was actually a youtube poop about making a YouTube poop, where like no the king from Zelda CDI like downloads Sony Vegas and makes a YouTube poop, <laughs> and so I, I just like, oh, you could do that. Like, and I, that's how I got into it. <laughs> um, Neil Cisariga is up there for me as well. Oh, classic! Um, yeah. Just because like he's so inventive in the ways he uses digital media to influence um, the online world, and he always has been. I think he might have a bigger footprint on today's internet culture than maybe any other individual, which is crazy because. At large, he's not talked about all that much, but he has such a huge influence. Yeah, that, he was one of the first creators that everybody talked about at school when I was younger, before YouTube was that yeah. popular, but he, like, everyone knew his videos, like the Potter yeah, Puppet exactly. Pals and all those. Ultimate Showdown, Brody Quest. Yeah. Any other influences in the world of YouTube, AVGN or anything like that? I used to love his um, videos. I was never too into AVGN. I think I, really. I didn't jump on the bandwagon in time. Um, but, um, yeah, oh, actually, I have a list somewhere. <laughs> but who was I watching, like, way back when? Um, Ego Raptor was always there, and I was a devote... I, I, I was a devoted Game Grumps fan for quite a few years Oh, me there. too, yeah. The 2013-ish. Dude, we should hang out. Oh, this is us hanging out. I suppose, yeah, it is. Inside the fridge. I used to look forward to the daily Game Grumps upload, coming back from school every day. That was a time. Yeah, huge. And what was it like when you first saw your own videos take off and have some success? Um, it was surreal. I couldn't really believe what was happening. So I think my first mark of success was um, during Game of Thrones Season 8. I think it was my Episode 5 video, The Bells, that just like overnight got more views than my entire channel had in the past two years. That makes sense. That was a big and, moment. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I guess people really liked what I had to say about it, uh, which was a lot of angry stuff. Um, and I was at work when I got to look at my YouTube analytics. I was a teacher. I was working two jobs at the time and doing some other YouTube stuff that I don't think I'm privy to discuss and also making my own video. So I was like burning the candle at four different ends. And then I saw my own channel doing well. And like, I, I'm pretty sure I cried <laughs> T tears of joy, tears of what the hell um, in the classroom. There were no children around to make fun of me, uh, fortunately. 
and it's been sort of an upward climb since then you know periods of just slow growth and then the show comes you know house of the dragon comes back and and that's another big bout of growth that we're about to have again so that's fun how was the trend are you currently a full-time YouTuber? Um, well, well it, it doesn't look like it, does it? But I don't have another job. <laughs> this right is on. the only job I have. How was that transition? When oh, you it was great. Um, <laughs> it was a tough choice because, you know, I'd worked at that job for seven or eight years. Um, and, you know, the guy I worked for had done a lot for me. But the nature of, our, of, of what we do is, like, you have to move on at some point. You can't just... You have to accept and um, jump at the creative opportunity in front of you when it presents itself. Because if you don't, then, God, you never know. Absolutely. Life gives you lemons and all that. Yeah, yeah. YouTube was making enough money to pay the bills and pay the rent. So uh, why not dive? head first into it absolutely that's what i've done i've tried to seize the opportunity as best i can and yeah well you seem to be doing it pretty well i'm always afraid that overnight everyone will leave though or something because your, your success hinges on people watching yeah you never know if people no are job going security to. here yeah that's the thing but it's worth the risk for me i'm a creative person i like it yeah and we're, we're in different fields because, so I was thinking about this just before. Um, what I do is I talk about a pretty static series. Like there are five books, uh, pending sixth, if you want to be hopeful about it. Um, and then every couple of years you get a new installment of episodes to talk about. Whereas, so like that's a pretty small field of things to discuss and people go very deep on it, but it's still the same amount of content. Whereas talking about Pokemon, it's an interactive thing where people are all always trying new stuff they're always competing with each other there's always new stories to tell and i think that's really interesting in that like the pokytube scene i thought it was gonna burn out years ago but it's still going and like it, it's bigger and better than ever now yeah, i gotta say it's like a very powerful niche to be to be uh, yeah to be into it often it can suck being into a niche because what if the game dies or like what if people lose interest in this particular topic but for pokemon there's like infinite things to talk about to be honest <laughs> and always, yeah new stuff happening and even in older meta games like gen 3 people are innovating and there's new things occurring yeah that's why i like your channel so much is that you talk about what's happening in these older meta games whereas it's just so great to see that something so old and storied can still be innovated upon yeah, I think it's it's awesome. That's what I have the most passion for. Well, Gen 3. Yeah, and, you know, old competitive games in general that people still play. Yeah. It's very cool to me. Absolutely. There was that um, Summoning Salt video about Tetris not too long ago, and, like, it did so well because people people are interested in what people are doing with these ancient video games. That stuff is awesome. I love the Tetris tournaments. Have you seen those? Very cool. Yeah, they're great. So hype. Yeah. It's like everyone understands it. There's no barrier for entry with Tetris. Everyone understands Tetris. That's true. And yet there's such depth as well. And I feel like most people, at least in our age bracket, understand how Pokemon works. That's the thing as well, yeah. It, it does have a pretty wide appeal because everyone's played a bit of Pokemon. So they see, even if the competitive is a bit harder to understand, like you see a, yeah, a video on the feed about, doubles, yeah. you know, Armaldo has this niche. And like, oh, I liked Armaldo when I played <laughs> back in the day. Let's t check this out. What's going on here? I liked Agron as a kid. What's Agron up to? Into oh. yeah, he's got a, Well, he's got a niche in Gen 3 though. So Well, good for him. <laughs> So there you go. I do have to say, though, I think, like, as far as media franchises go that are mostly finished, A Song of Ice and Fire is a pretty powerful one. I feel like there's a lot to yeah. talk about, and people have really spread it thin. <laughs> like, there's just, like, the you, you and Alt Shift X doing the food description, which was surprisingly great content. It's, it sounds like a meme, but then... Yeah, I was shocked to see our first stream on that topic get a million views. Like, that, that blew my mind. <laughs> <laughs> I was one of them, mate. It was great. <laughs> Only one. Oh, wow. Well, no, I did actually, to be honest, I returned to that video <laughs> and I watched it again. Uh, um, it's so funny that like, that was an April Fool's shit post and it, it's gone on to be a massive series. And one of the things I'm most known for, you, you don't choose how you get popular. Truly. And the horse thing was, it, was a bloody April Fool's one. Exactly. It? Yeah, I thought that was just going to be a one and done little joke inside a, a video about something else entirely. But it's turned out to become like the character of my entire career. That's what I have happens. poisoned several subreddits just in, in that one joke. That makes two of us with horse related uh, memes <laughs> taking a life of their own. <laughs> yeah, I've seen the horse council getting around. <laughs> People who don't watch my channel are getting confused by like, what is Maca Macago is not a horse, Jimothy? What are you talking about? Little do they know that he, he learns the move high are horse you a power. Horse, um, at at heart, are you a horse purist or a horse anarchist? Macago is a horse. I'm a horse anarchist. <laughs> yeah, good. I agree. 
I also am a horse anarchist because I'm saying that eight-year-old boys are horses. That's true, though. That's verifiable. It it's the only... It, it's in the text. It says that he's a horse. I I have to be honest with you and say that I I have not read the, all of the books, but I've recently started uh, listening to the audiobook, loving it. And every time they say the word a horse, I laugh a little bit. <laughs> it's such a funny word. It's, yeah. it's one of the funniest words ever, maybe. It sounds like they're saying they're a horse. <laughs> they're... It does. <laughs> What do you think your favorite uh, fan theory is in A Song of Ice and Fire? Gosh, my favorite fan theory. Um, A lot of them are just probably the truth because pe people have dissected the thing so much. It, like it's called a theory, but it's probably the actual truth. Like some stuff with Blood Raven and all the... the... There are so many equally compelling but contradictory theories. So it's tough to discern which of these two equally plausible things is going to, to be the actual truth. Um, well, I think just on the face of it, in a technical sense, Jon Snow being the son of Rhaegar and Lyanna is still a fan theory. Yeah, it's not confirmed in the books. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, so I guess I have to say that, even though like I have my problems with it, it's a bit, it's a bit tropey, isn't it? And it sort of goes against the concept of Jon Snow's story. Although there's still room to dissect that in the following two books, if if he ever gets around to that. Um, you know, the idea that uh, your your worth in the world is earned, not given to you upon your birth. Um, so Jon Snow being a secret prince who is actually the heir to the realm is sort of at odds with that. But it also allows him to make a massive choice about what he actually wants to be in this world, which is like the main theme of Jon Snow's story. So it does make sense that George would present him with the opportunity to become king so that Jon has to grapple with that decision as he has grappled with every other decision in his story so far. So it's a pretty good theory and I, I like the implications of it. I think R plus L equals J is a good idea, it turns out. Well, it'll probably end up being a subversion of that trope, like everything else is in the series. It's yeah. like, exactly like the Aragorn from Lord of the Rings thing. Mm. But uh... Yeah, uh, Ice and Fire exists in a really interesting space where it's at once a love letter to fantasy. Let's just say Lord of the Rings directly, but it's also a deconstruction of all of its ideas. Yeah, kind of like a... Maybe like a good, the bad, and the ugly situation where yeah. a deconstruction of the genre, but it's also one of the best examples of the genre at the same time. Yeah, and I feel like Ice and Fire is exactly that. It is a great example. It's one of the best installments of the fantasy canon and also a big question mark at fantasy. I think I might have my favorite world building in anything I've ever ever read. It really captivated me, the show, and the, the books go into even more detail yeah. about every little thing, and it's so captivating and awesome. I complain about um, the world of Ice and Fire which is this coffee table book he published what well, almost 10 years ago or something um like it, it you think it ruins the mistake a little bit maybe maybe a little bit but there's lots of fun stuff in there as well and you know who am i to judge the people who wanted that yeah it's fun world building's always fun the world building in Pokemon has always thrown me for a loop because it's like a loose collection of many ideas that don't really have um, an integrated canon or through line. That's one of my favorite Pokemon games are the ones that don't delve too deep into the storyline and the, so you can kind of suspend your disbelief about the inherent absurdity of the very concept. <laughs> but I don't know, that's a contentious opinion. A lot of people really like the stories in the later games and stuff. Yeah, I'm, I, th I think I'm with you on that one. Like Gen 1 and 2 and 3 have a cool, uh, and a bit of Gen 4 as well, I guess, have a cool... Like there is some wonder and magic to the Pokemon world, but yeah. it's not like a deep thing of world building where everything makes sense and it's like lore. Yeah, I, I, I think Gen 1 is actually my favorite in terms of um, lore, story and presentation of that sort of thing. Because there's so much like hidden detail in these books that, you know, you find in the Pokemon Mansion... Um, and is there some in the in the lab on Cinnabar as well, where it's like sort of telling you what happened here, but not in any direct terms. Um, and it appeals to the themes of the games of genetics. Um, and it's, it's just cool. But it's also completely optional. You can go through the entire game without even noticing that genetics is a theme in Gen 1. I think I'm with you. The whole uh, Mewtwo being made in a lab thing, that's, that's a cool idea. And the... The theory that Ditto is like a failed Mew clone is also interesting. Yeah, and it's all like this sort of implied, like it might not even be canon, but it is, y you know? It, it, it just sparks the brain more than being told what's going on. Yeah, and all the stuff with the Marowak, uh, Cuba yeah. wearing a skull and of its mother, apparently. <laughs> the, the whole uh, Lavender Town stuff was, is kind of compelling as well. It's, sort of, it's quite dark for a children's game in a way that you don't often see these days. True.
It is interesting looking back at Gen 1. When, before Gen Pokemon 1 was so a mega franchise. And... Yeah, when it was just like a, a couple of monster collecting games. That it's just like a JRPG. It's not an institution unto itself yet. This is just what Pokemon was. And now it's this whole thing. Like, it, it's sort of incredible what they managed to get done in the first generation. Yeah, it is a technical feat for sure. And a I think revolutionary also, um, concept with the interactivity yeah, of yeah. trading and everything. Yeah. Yeah. It's not easy it's to forget. It's a design feat. Um, because yeah. I think it has maybe the tightest story of any of the Pokemon generations, which might be a controversial thing. But I think that the um, the themes, the plot points of the game are so well uh, connected to each other that every other generation since, well, most generations since, have just fallen back on the idea that there is going to be a champion of the Elite Four. When, like, that was an idea born from the plot thread of Blue the Rival in Gen Gen one yeah they're, they're mostly piggybacking off the ideas of the first one for sure yeah, yeah. like there's so many things that are just set in stone from those first games almost 30 years ago it's incredible yeah i'm a big fan of the the, the mother series too and there was a lot of inspiration from that that you can definitely yeah, that tell be talked about more like yeah i made a video with this youtuber called monkey ness who was a mother youtuber about the parallels between the first pokemon game and mother like Mewtwo is inspired by the final boss of Mother, who's this like weird grotesque guy, awesome. fetus guy who represents some effed up stuff. But it's it's really interesting. Yeah, it's I think the the design, designers knew each other and yeah, it's cool. Hell yeah, check that out, folks. Monkey Ness on YouTube, good channel. Who was your favorite Pokemon, Gladys? Oh gosh, like it it, it feels wrong to not say Gligor or Gliscor. And I do love them. It's not just because of the resemblance. They are my boys. I love them dearly. Gligar's fun, although he did he did get semi-banned in Gen 3 for, I, for having I evasion. I think that's pretty incredible for, for someone so, you know, otherwise unremarkable stats-wise to be banned for that um, exploit. Hey, you, you name-dropped me in, um, in the Cacti video, didn't you? I did do that. That was, <laughs> that was so weird for me to experience. <laughs> I was just vibing out to a Jimothy Cool video and I suddenly did. I'm on screen. <laughs> Forgive me. It was the first thing that popped into my head. So <laughs> I'd make my videos very spontaneously. It would be funny to just reference Gladys. In this. <laughs> yeah, and you did it with, like, you just completely skated past it. It was great. So dry in that um that beautifully Australian way we have. Can you tell that I, I take a bit from Alt-Shift-X in my presentation of my, my videos? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it sort of gets hit, like, um it's not the old style Alt-Shift-X where you have the video editing that gives you whiplash from all of the... Um, slides whooshing around. That's but, kind of the, yeah, the, I, the I cadence of how he talks. And yeah, the straightforward academic tone. In the Pokemon games... <laughs> um, he <laughs> hates it when you make fun of uh, um, saying the Game of Thrones books. It's so funny. My apologies. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's great. Um, he's a big inspiration to me as well. I mean, me as well. Have you two thought about having just having a podcast together? Because I think your streams together are some of the some of the best content um yeah we, we're actually currently experimenting with the idea of doing a podcast like a proper podcast because we're, we're basically already sort of podcasts um aren't we yeah they are yeah so like just maybe codifying that the thing is we're both um doing a podcast it's like the one thing you do that day especially when it's four hours long and you put research into it and it is it's pretty exhausting to present especially if it's live streaming which i guess it wouldn't have to be but um you know it's just it's a bit more of a commitment than we thought it would be true so we're, we're figuring out the logistics of that you can scale back the preparation and just wing it uh, do you have a chemistry just 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 vibe it for the sake of making it more like easy to produce maybe I don't know. Yeah, although we, we're we both quite um, strung up on quality. And it shows. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm amazed at, at your ability to talk about a pretty deep fantasy series for like five hours straight. It's It sounds like a, seems like a marathon, very tiring. I can only stream um, for a maximum so much of like with four hours. Oh, true, you can. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, when you have a co-host, it makes everything easier. But I did do some solo streams back in the day, and they are much harder. And I, I really did feel exhausted by the end of a three or four hour stream. Yeah, a lot of streams that there's not much talking. It's mostly some gaming. But your streams are just constant talking and pretty Yappin'. high energy stuff, like cracking jokes, analyzing. That's that's tiring. Yeah. So it's really good to have found someone who you know I have chemistry with. Who someone actually compared us to Game Grumps once, and I, and that was like the the greatest compliment I've ever received. I can see that. 
couple of friends <laughs> discussing what is it grease running down your chin <laughs> yeah that's right Maybe we should play Kirby Air Ride or something. Or Pokemon. Pokemon alignment chart. The morality of average <laughs> Gen 3. Where does Makago fit on that? I think he's chaotic good. Uh, oh, he's definitely good. I, I'm just thinking of Flame Body and, um, you know, helping other, like, Pokemon eggs hatch. I think that's more of a lawful thing to do. That is. That's altruistic. In fact, yeah. he's lawful good, no more I think about it. Ninjask, definitely chaotic evil. We can get that out. We can Absolutely. establish that. Yeah. <laughs> Who's lawful evil? Maybe Skarmory. That's a, that's a good call. Good. You know what's up with Skarmory? He's not breaking any rules or being illegitimate. But, but he's still a dick. You can't help it. When he chip heals like 200% over the course of the game, protects, come in, he's <laughs> immune to everything. I mean, he's kind of a bastard. But we can we can be yeah, honest. He's not breaking the rules. Cacturn is breaking the rules. Yeah, Cacturn is he's at the very bottom right of chaotic evil for certain. Now I want to play Dungeons & Dragons role playing as certain Pokemon. That could be fun. Are you a Dungeons of Dragons fan? Dungeons and Dragons? Um, not as much of a mega fan as you find, but I, I'm pretty into it. I don't have the time to, um, you know, subscribe to all these podcasts or whatever, but I like the occasional game with mates. It seems like a lot of effort. You've got one guy who has to, I mean, I don't know how it works exactly, but doesn't one guy have to write a whole storyline and like... Um, you get into it what you put in. Uh, sorry, you get out of it what you put into it. Um, like, you can do an entire day of preparation for a session, or you can completely wing it, and maybe it's not as good. Or maybe you're extremely good at improvising what you need to, and it's going to be fine either way. You know, it's entirely dependent on your own skills and what you put into it. My brother used to be really into Dungeons & Dragons. And the guy who was the Game Master, I always thought, why don't you just, like, write a book instead? Because you would do all this preparation, like, all this lore, and... It's like a lot of effort. Well, I don't know. Why didn't you just write a dang fantasy novel at that point? Well, the difference is that um, Dungeons & Dragons is collaborative storytelling because the players mm. are the characters. Um, and that means that like, as a storyteller, you don't have to decide what the characters do. You just present them with the situation and then the characters figure out what to do from there, which is really great. Um, and The Expanse actually started like that. It was a tabletop game. Um being played by Ty Frank and Daniel Abraham, and they turned it into a science fiction novel. Oh, that's cool, yeah. Yeah, so um, George R. R. Martin obviously was a great fan of tabletop games back in the 70s and 80s. Yeah, sometimes that well. actually can evolve into a, into a story. That... Yeah. Yeah. And the other way around, of course, because so much tabletop is based on existing fantasy and sci-fi novels. You played any of the, the uh, Pokemon. Song of Ice <laughs> Pokemon and Fire tabletop game. No, I haven't games? played it. Oh, the board games. I've played um, the Game of Thrones board game um and well there's like game of thrones risk and monopoly but those are just risk and monopoly so whatever i've played game of thrones risk and uh the game of thrones board game is great i really like it it's yeah good, cool artwork i really too. liked it too i do play where's a lot the, of um, board games with my brothers where's the, where's the pokemon tabletop game tabletop rpg is that a thing does that exist I've never heard of such a thing. I, surely it does. Like, they got merchandise of everything, but... It looks like there isn't. Really? That, that's I, I like an played the card game back in the day. You know how, like, most people just collect the cards and trade them? I played the game. Well, you're, you got above average intelligence compared to the average child then. <laughs> that was complicated. I just liked the funny artwork, you know? <laughs> I, I really like oh, card games. Serious business. Now. Yeah? Back in the day, not so much. Are you still playing po Pokemon much these days, or was it just a childhood thing for you? Um, occasionally, I'll crank open Emerald in, in the old emulator and run it at 1,000% speed because I don't have the time for all of that. <laughs> That's um, the classic. Yeah, it's great fun. I'm actually really into solo uh, challenge uh, run channels on YouTube. Um, so I do a little bit of that as well in my own time. And I've done a couple of Nuzlocks, but also, like, who has the time, man? I've always been more into the multiplayer side. But yeah, I was never into fun. that. Um, I, I didn't have... Like, I, uh, my friends moved on from Pokemon long before I did. So I didn't really have anyone who wanted to play with me in my in life. Um, and I wasn't really geared towards online play either. So I was basically left to my own devices. That's unfortunate. I mostly played on the battle simulators. That's, that was the best way to do it back in the day. Yeah. But I'm probably a pretty weird Pokemon fan. Like, I don't have much affinity for the single player experience, which is most of the appeal for like 90 percent of the consumer base i do i play for the mechanics folks we're into the real nitty gritty stuff here in the fridge i'm a higher brow gamer most wouldn't get us that's something i didn't understand about pokemon until i started really engaging with the competitive side of things on youtube 
is how deep a game it is mechanically and competitively. I think I heard Wolf Glick say that it is the most complicated game you can play. And that, that I might be misattributing that or misquoting slightly, but that was the essence of it. And I've been thinking about that and it, it might be true. Well, there's like StarCraft Brood War and stuff, I suppose. There's complicated games. Pokemon is more complicated than you would expect. It's also very yeah. unique. Like, what other competitive turn-based RPG is out there? It's like a, a pretty novel thing. It's fun. And many turn-based strategy games are like, one guy takes their turn and the next guy takes their turn. But in Pokemon, it's simultaneous because of the speed mechanic. So that you can do mind games. So it's a yeah. bit like... And, like, how many of that sort of game have over a thousand different pieces you can play with? True, yeah. And amongst all the Pokemon, are there any, like, repeats? Are there any two Pokemon that are exactly the same? There's a lot of, like, overlap in Pokemon that outclass other ones, especially as the franchise has gone on and all the Pokemon get left in the dust a bit. But they do occasionally, like, give them new stuff. Yeah. Give them new abilities that make them better. Try to keep them balanced and relevant which pokemon would you most like to see that happen to do you want to see brought into the modern day with a buff or something selfishly I, i'm a big fan of dodrio for whatever Hell reason yeah. i've always been very fond of dodrio it's, Love it's dodrio. a good mix of like pretty normal pretty basic like it's just a bird but it's also it's got weird spherical heads and it's got three heads it's got gumption and it, all, it it's hits pretty hard. Pay. It's got a high attack stat. Yeah. What about Mega Dodrio in Pokemon Legends? Oh, he gets a fourth Z, head. A, no, it gets five heads. Oh. It's like a Hydra. Now there's an idea. They did make Mega Pidgeot. Yeah, that was so that was a choice. They should have done Dodrio. The fans would have gone yeah. insane. Like who was who was itching to use Pidgeot again? Uh, yeah, I don't know. He's he's iconic, isn't he? He's one of the most well-known birds. Everyone likes Pidgey, I guess. I guess he is just a bird, though. Dodrio is a bit more interesting, in my yeah. opinion. I, I love how many Gen One Pokemon evolve by having, but by, by like gaining an extra one of themselves, like a Doug Trio, um, coughing. <laughs> yeah, but Adam Magnemite. There's a lot of them. Yeah, yeah. Just becoming That's free of itself. <laughs> well, then the inverse happens with Exegute, who becomes goes from twelve sentient eggs into one tree creature. A bit cosmically horrifying. Um, they're not eggs; they're seeds. Ah, oh, forgive me. <laughs> <laughs> was it was he called egg, egg in the name? Then what's up with that? He's got the move Egg Bomb as well in his move set. Because it looks like an egg. I see. I've been deceived. I love these, these like random signature moves from Gen One that never get seen again. They're, they're great. It's kind of like Twin Needles, pretty trash, and like Egg Bomb. <laughs> <laughs> It's just worse than, like, Return. <laughs> Why would you use it? Yeah, it's like, we just put this move in the game so that this one Pokemon has something. Now every Pokemon gets some ridiculous signature move. It's a whole thing. Yeah, I don't keep up with, like, modern innovations in Pokemon. Like, I, I just don't really care too much about Pokemon number 1176. You don't like you know? Goldengo? Looks like a cheese stringer. You don't like I him? I do like Goldengo. <laughs> He's a cool guy, I think. I, I've grown fond of him. He's a bit of a mascot for me. Don't you like Iron um, Jugulus? He was really smart. <laughs> That's a smart guy. <laughs> I don't know. I think it's just that Gen 3 is still more appealing to me, mostly because of nostalgia. But I, I, maybe it's just like the right level of complexity for me, the right number of different pieces, the right number of mechanics. I'm in full agreement, obviously. It's it's right before the, the franchise changed to the, the new mechanical system. So it's like the most uh, complete version of the old game engine, I guess. Yeah, so, yeah, I, exactly. Um, yeah. Like, this, the, the physical special split makes sense, but I'm glad that Gen 3 exists without it. Yeah, for sure. Like, it, it stands out mechanically because of that. Is would a Gen 1 or Gen 3 your favorite gen? I think it's got to be Gen 3. Sorry, Carmine, who wanted it to be Gen 2. He's damn right, folks, as usual. He never misses. <laughs> gen 3 supremacy. Yeah, I love it. Although some of my favorite Pokemon are from after Gen 3, like I had to, someone asked me for a Q&A video that I'm working on what my favorite Pokemon of each type is, and for Ice I had to say Frostlass. Frostlass is a great design. Yeah, I just love her. There's a big controversy about Frostlass in the Gen 4 metagame. I don't know is if you've there? heard about this, but it's only- What did she do? Is she being cancelled? The only ability Frostlass has is Snow Cloak, which is similar to Sand Veil, but in Hail. Uh -huh. And uh, so alongside a Bomber Snow, you could- uh, abuse evasion with that but the thing is that right. obama snow is not exactly like the most common pokemon of all time it's not like tyranitar in gen 3 where it's on every team so even if you run cacturn or back when cacturn was allowed even if you ran cacturn without tyranitar on your team 
the enemy probably bring in Tyranitar, so you're going to get the evasion. But it's not really the case with Frostlass. It's not like uh, you're going to run a Frostlass honestly without the lame strategy. And the right. enemy's just going to bring in a bomber snow. Like, that's very unlikely. But it got banned anyway. But it would Snowcloak got banned. But people wanted it to be, so you'd instead ban the combination of Snowcloak and a bomber snow on the same team, which would solve the problem and preserve, preserve the usage of Frostlass in the other situations where it's not a problem. I think another solution would be, like, giving Frostlass a, a different ability, but I know how people are about adding stuff to Pokemon yeah it's a slippery slope with modding the game itself and yeah changing because you could have done Macactone too but then I don't know you could what if Latios could you just remove Levitate from it would it be balanced or if you remove Drizzle from Kyogre or something yeah then you're then it's a whole can of worms yeah we got a couple like Pokemon Song of Ice and Fire crossover questions one of them from Halifax Steppenwolf we are three favorite characters in a Song of Ice and Fire and what Pokemon would they use I'm going to treat Ice and Fire as the main book series here rather than all the expanded lore stuff. So no Damon, no Egg. Um, and I'd say my three favorite characters are probably Jamie Lannister, Theon Greyjoy, and... Oh, who's it going to be? God, I've been I've spent so much time on House of the Dragon recently. I've barely thought about the main books. Um, Eddard Stark? I don't know. <laughs> I do love Eddard Stark. He's pretty cool. Let's go Eddard Stark. Just for simplicity, just so we can get on with it. Because I could be here for a very long time trying to choose one. And Jamie Lannister. I mean, it just, like, Charizard. No, hang on. Um, no. One of the lions, probably, right? Oh, can I? Theon Greyjoy is Tentacruel, by the way, obviously. True. I love Tentacruel, by the way. Yeah, very cool Pokemon. Unfortunate that it gets owned by Dugtrio so much. Yeah. Uh, it would otherwise be all right in Gen 3. Yeah, but it's, it's such a cool design. Yeah, it looks fantastic. In Gen 5, it's broken, so it has that. Oh, maybe I should make the switch to black and Gen white. Gen 5 is cool. It's actually alright. What's your least favorite metagame while I think about these Pokemons? Definitely Gen 8. And people are mad at me for saying so, but I, I said Gen 9 for a while. I was very anti-Gen 9 for most of it because it, it was very annoying with how all the broken stuff. But they've actually banned most of the bad stuff and the metagame's settling. And it's actually pretty fun with Terra. But Gen 8 is just a snooze in my opinion. Right. Because it has... All this annoying defensive Pokemon and like heavy duty boots spam and it was before all the moveset cuts of Gen 9 so a bunch of stuff gets knock off and there's also Gen 9, Gen 8 teleport which is a slow pivoting move meaning you can completely safely pivot out it's like Slowbro and Blissey. I'm not a fan of all that. And the new Pokemon are just not visually very interesting to me except like Rillaboom. I like Rillaboom. Yeah, monkey. Monkeys yeah, are I, I agree with you there. I, I never liked hearing about what was happening in Gen 8. Um, I've decided that Jamie Lannister's fav uh, Pokemon, like his signature dude, would be Pyroar. I forgot about Pyroar. They did make like a... He's a weird Pokemon, but he's normal fire type, which is a fun Yeah, combo. Uh, that's quite interesting. Yeah. I guess he is pretty normal. He's just a lion. It adds <laughs> up. And I'm thinking for Ned, maybe even something like Snorlax. What's the logic there? Just, uh, well, so Snorlax he's honorable? shows up really early on. He's honorable. He's, pl he's honest. He's plain and transparent. And he's strong, but he can be dealt with. That adds up. And that's a more interesting a answer than just fellow. some wolf Pokemon. Because it, it aligns with his character. Well, I, it, it's just, it's not going to be Rockruff, is it? And it's like Mighty Anna, that's not Ned. Yeah, that's Luxray now. That's an evil Pokemon. With ill intentions. Lord Mudkip asks, How would the existence of Pokemon alter the wars in A Song of Ice and Fire? Would knights ride on top of Pokemon? Is Tyrek Lannister a Macago? <laughs> I think, if anything, Ty Tyrek Lannister is going to be a Rapidash. Oh, probably a Ponytar, actually. That lines up perfect. Um, if as for, like, how it affects war, it depends on, like, if you can catch... Like, th whichever house has captured a Rayquaza, a Mega Rayquaza, like, they're just going to win, right? Yes. Or if someone, man if, like, illegally catches Which is catches kind of what the Targaryens did in the, in the Day exactly. of Aegon's Conquest. <laughs> they so caught a Mega Rayquaza. The analogy isn't even really an analogy, because there's already dragons in Ice and Fire. Perhaps it would so even I'm, the odds and give the other houses a bit more... Well, uh, yeah, I was thinking that the Starks have the best advantage being up in all that snow and ice. Because, because ice of course, beats dragons. gives them a type advantage against the dragons. Correct. Exactly. Although the, the Targaryen dragons are probably going to be fire type as well, aren't they? True. And dragons tend to have fire coverage at the very least. Yeah. So it's a mixed bag. And yeah, how would you tame them? Can they invent Pokeballs? They're a primitive society. They've got to yeah, tame them the old-fashioned old... way. And I don't know if hmm. that'll work. 
Can a medieval society invent the Pokeball? T I guess skin changing and Targaryen, the dragon bond oh. is a bit like uh, is a bit like Pokemon, but in a messed up way. Yeah. You like invade the mind of this creature to bend its will to do yours. But nothing's powerful enough in the universe to, to beat dragons. Hmm. Maybe Ned would use Frostlass, I'm just thinking, because he's obsessed with the past. He thinks about his dead sister Liana a lot, so that's a that's ghost. An ice and ghost. you know, he he's from Winterfell, so yeah, it's all icy. That actually that's perfect. You've done it. Theory crafting is so easy. <laughs> Which Pokemon game do you think has the best soundtrack? That was a question from Riddle Dow. That is a very um pertinent question because of course I'm a composer and I'm that's big true. into music analysis. Um, however, I haven't listened to every Pokemon soundtrack obsessively, so I might not be the most well positioned to answer this. My favorite is probably Gen 3, just because of how well it matches the aesthetic of the uh, game itself. I know a lot of, like, they all basically do that, but it's so striking in Gen 3, mostly because of the trumpets. Yeah, I like the Gen, it feels like you're on an adventure in a mystical land. It fits... It adds to the yeah the wonder and like it, it, Gen Three has Little Root Town, like the most calming piece of music ever composed. Verdant Turf Town is my favorite uh, song in the in the series, which I use for my outro. Yeah, yeah, I really like hearing that at the end of your videos. My buddy composed that. That's fun. And it was a good change for me because I I didn't I wasn't the biggest fan of your old outro. I'm sorry to say. Yeah, that, I mean that's a whole can of worms that I won't get into. With, with what oh, happened yeah, to that. I'm aware of that. <laughs> Jeez. But, you know, I, when I, I was I was going to sleep, you know, and, and then oh, some, yes. you know, it was very loud. So this one's bombastic. more calming. It's a good change, Absolutely. maybe. It's for the best. Yeah. Because your voice is so soothing and the information is so... It's just someone politely telling you what's going on in Gen 5 OU this week. And then you suddenly hear, oh, it's Magic Carp. Like, I do love the stadium announcer. Don't get me wrong. But I'm trying... I'm, I'm on the oh, precipice <laughs> of Dreamland. I apologize. I forgive you. I would probably say Gen 3 as well for the best soundtrack, but Gen 4 has a fantastic soundtrack too. Yeah. With it does. Many of the best songs in the whole series in Gen 4. I will not disagree with you there. Gen 2 some has some um, hidden gems as well, doesn't it? Yeah, I feel like the, the Game so Boy hidden. sound is a bit harsh, but yeah, uh, it's like not their they fault, get the right? That's... Well. Yeah, it's the hardware they were working with, and it scrubs up well in the remakes. You've got to give some respect to the Gen 1 soundtrack too, probably the most iconic Absolutely. It's like so overplayed at this point, like the Pallet Town music, all the Roots themes, but you can kind of recognize every song in Gen 1. Like they're yeah. all very recognizable and evocative of the whole fr uh, feel of the franchise. So yeah. Give some and I credit. have to commend um, how well composed it is with the limitations of the hardware. They're working with, what, four channels and one of them is only producing white noise. So really you only have three tone producing channels in that sound chip. And they created all of that very complex and fast moving music. Um, and, you know, the the music often drops out when the game has to produce a sound effect. That's how that's how tight the resources we're working with are. And it's yeah. still so brilliant. And considering the hardware limitation, like most of the motifs and little jingles and, and the songs themselves are still used in every game. Like the Pokemon Center theme and the like level up themes, yeah. the healing yeah. theme, everything's... All the spawns from that game, which was working with such limited hardware. Yeah, it's I think that story. Gen 1 really is a miraculous series of games. It's true. We can't deny it. Bedbound Bed Devil asked, Are you a collector at heart? Even if it's not Pokemon, is there something that makes you want to catch them all? Um, <laughs> this might be a bit unconventional, but I do have a collection of Rubik's Cubes awesome. and Rubik's Cube style spinnies puzzles. Sam, are you a cuber? Yeah, are, are you? Yeah. <laughs> no way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah, I had a friend who was really into it in school and I I just learned to, to fit in. <laughs> and I, it's my go-to little... going spin. It's my go-to little, like, fidget spinner equivalent. Like, I got a cube next to me yeah, right now. Yeah, me too. Like, it's just great to um have my hands do something. But I feel like I'm smart, like, m more so than when I'm using a fidget spinner or something like that. It does make you look smart, but it's actually not that... It's not as uh, complex as people would assume. You just got to remember. Yeah, once like, you know what you're doing, it's some so algorithms, easy. algorithms, and then you got it. Yeah, I have quite a few different ones. I have a 3x3... Three three, I have a 2x2 two two up to 7x7. Seven seven. You got a Megaminx? <laughs> yeah, I've got a Megaminx. I've got a Killer Minx and a Gigaminx. Jeez. 
Have you got the pyramid? What's yeah. the pyramid one called? Yeah, Pyraminx. Yeah, I've got one of those. I, have I don't know how to solve Neuro most Cube. of them. Yeah, no, the, the Gigaminx is uh, mostly beyond me. It takes me like, that's that's the one thing I'm doing that day if I want to solve the Gigaminx. You just learn the 3x3 three because three, that's the only one I know. And the 2x2 two two you can just do, it's easy. Yeah, 2x2 two two is quite easy. I tried learning 4x4 four um, four and I, I couldn't figure it out. That, the 4x4 four four might, might be more fun for me than the 3x3. Three it's just got, as I said earlier about Gen 3, it's just like the right level of complexity. I can see that. I do like the 5x5 five five though. Beyond that, it gets a bit too tedious. That's crazy that you're also a Cuba. Who knew? Yeah, I've actually met um, Felix Zemdegs. The, um, uh -huh. Does he still hold the world record? I don't know, but uh, yeah. a friend we of mine went to, went to school together. with him as well. No way. It's a small world, folks. <laughs> yeah, that's, the, that's a crossover right there. He's Australian. That's a, that's a point of pride for our country. Yeah, they can't take that away from us. He's the the Rubik's Cube world record holder, folks, if you weren't aware. But I think he might have been overtaken, I'm not sure. Not up to date. Yeah, he, he definitely was. But he's a legend in the in the scene. Yeah, he's outstanding in his field. <laughs> I was waiting to find him. <laughs> <laughs> to sneak that one in. <laughs> okay, I didn't expect that, like like you said, with the April Fool's stuff, I didn't expect that one to become a little running joke. Oh, so it was great. just a one-off <laughs> comment I made in one of my... It's a brilliant pun. <laughs> it's a joke my uncle makes that I think is it's just a classic uh, dad <laughs> joke. So, but it's, it's, it does have it does have um, uncle vibes to it, yeah. What do scarecrows even do? They like have a utility? I'm not sure. They scare crows. <laughs> it, it, it's supposed to make them think that there's a dude there. Yeah. That was a stupid question, wasn't it? Yeah, it, it's one of the few things where the utility is in the name. Folks, uh, that was a blunder by me, forgive me. He drops the ball on that one. We can recover, though. Here's an interesting one from Sam Sita. If each of the Stark children were a Pokemon, which would each be if they became a Pokemon? God. Oh, you're going to have to help me with this one. Um, Rob Stark is Metagross. Well, I, hmm. <laughs> Metagross, explain that. Uh... He's a solid Pokemon, but he got defeated by treachery because he gets dug trapped and mag trapped. I see. I, I, see. I like that. <laughs> but Rob also gets undone by his own sense of honor, which is like his obligation. That's to Meteor his Mash missing his or exploding into Gengar. Yeah. So that adds up too. Yep. Okay, cool. We got it. <laughs> Rob Stark and Metagross. It, was, it should have been obvious, really. Um, next in order of like Starks would probably be Sansa. Um, <sighs> That's uh, Blissey? I don't know. Yeah, yeah, Bliss is good because it's like this lovely, fanciful Pokemon that's sort of forced to be savage. True, yeah, because you got to run special attack on Bliss here, Gen 3. you got to run Ice Beam to keep up with Doug Trio, and that's the analog for the politics of the, the Red yeah, Cape. Yeah, I was going to ask, who is Doug Trio in this scenario? That's the, the collective of, like, Littlefinger, just, Cersei, and... Yeah, <laughs> the concept of King's Landing. <laughs> this makes sense, folks, don't worry. It's, and you do get arena trapped in King's Landing. That happens. That's how yeah, Ned she died. cannot. She can't leave. Or she's struggling to leave. Next would be Arya. Arya. Ooh, that's where you actually are getting into Poochina, Mightyina territory. Or it could it be Gengar? Because Gengar has a lot of trickery with its sets, much like the trickery of uh, the the many faces. Well, because speaking of face changing, she could even be Ditto or or something good. Or Zoroark. Even. Maybe Zoroark. Yeah. That would add up. Actually, maybe Zorua, because she has the potential to go into something doing that, but she's still sort of just a cute little yeah, fox she hasn't thing evolved at the yet. moment. She's not evolved yeah, yet. Yeah. That's perfect. Zorua. <laughs> then would be uh, Bran. Bran is definitely psychic of some sort, right? That's interesting. Is Bran like Celebi? The connection with the, the old gods? That's yeah, a, grass and psychic. That's a, what do you, Trilogy of the Forest. Yeah. There you go. Calm Mind is... A concept <laughs> yeah yeah um although brand is like very physically frail do you think celebi really encapsulates that as much as it could well, uh, celebi's got base 100 stats for everything so not yeah re i guess uh maybe alakazam because alakazam has like one defense oh yeah but a lot of intelli intellect and psychic powers so they that would that would make sense and rickon is a savage little guy i don't know much about rickon he's not like a premier it, yeah he's barely a character he's a kid so that's zigzagoon <laughs> yeah he has the potential to do anything he m could maybe evolve into lenoon and do belly drum extreme speed wing yeah, condition well, yeah that's the threat a lot of people expect him to 
you know, at the cost of his own health, be it be a savage warrior. So and entirely belly drum. Yeah, that's moon. belly drum. Exactly. Yeah. Who knew that this would actually and, you know, <laughs> have real parallels to the... Yeah, this is actually resulting in some genuine analysis. Amazing. He's also, you know, sought after as, you know, he, he will be my claimant to the north is what Wyman Manderley thinks, is what uh, Davos Seaworth and... So Wyman Manderley is think. God of War, because God of War uses Memento to set up for the Linoon Wing condition. Of course. So that would... That He's also... um completely um engrossed in the memory of his dead children so that's another hint at yes Memento, because no? um your teammates explode on that team too yeah so <laughs> that uh, that completely tracks it all lines up george actually knew about all of this when he wrote well when, um, when did pokemon come out after the first book probs um it was actually 1996 which was the same year same, as the yeah. Game of Thrones. They were working together. Much like how yeah. he worked on the Lore of Elden Ring. Many people don't know. That's he, right. He actually George has always worked. been involved in world crafting for these Japanese video game franchises. And then there's Jon Snow. That's a, that's a tough one. Could he be Salamence? <laughs> no, that's... Well, <laughs> who's like a, like a secret dragon? Because that's just a direct dragon. Well, a secret dragon, wouldn't that be... You know, people excluded from the Dragon Club, like Gyarados and Charizard. I suppose. You think I... that there's controversy in the Horse Council? My goodness, the Dragon Council the... has been having debates like this for decades. That's a political world I do not want to delve into. Mm. The Horse Council is comparatively simple in its affairs. Although I don't know if Horsey belongs on there. I think he weaseled his way in. He's got Horse in his name and he's been carrying that. But he doesn't have any horsepower. Look, and he's clearly as, a fish. As a horse anarchist, seahorses are horses. That might be where we we have a schism in this <laughs> in this debate. But I don't know about I that. I recently visited a number of aquaria, and upon seeing the seahorses there, I was like, I am looking at a herd of horses right now. Oh, you don't have hands-on experience. <laughs> it's hard to argue with such a thing. Hmm. Well, well. So maybe Kingdra is the only Pokemon that is actually on both the Horse Council and the Dragon Council. Kingdra is the liaison the... between these two political parties. That's true. But Kingdra is, is weirdly not present on the Horse Council at the moment. What is he doing? What is he He's up to? He's probably busy. Tune into my next upload and maybe there'll be some, some exposition <laughs> about where Kingdra is in all this. <laughs> Because the, 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 the plot thickens, folks. I love Kingdra. One of my favorite Pokemon, actually. Yeah. He's got Swift Swim. Oh, yours too. Just love its design, really. One of those Pokemon that has a has a great visual design and gameplay design, in my opinion. Because it has pretty bad stats, but it has a fantastic typing with only one weakness. And Swift Swim, which turns it into a powerful threat despite its poor stats. I just like that um, something so epic came out of something. Like, in Gen 1, you wouldn't expect Seedra to be... The next dragon type. Yeah, Kingdra was a Gen sort 2 just... invention, and then that was a yeah, that was such fun. So when you fight Claire in Gen 2, you're like, oh my god, there's a new dragon, and it came from Cedra. That's so crazy, and it was crazy. How wonderful and magical. That's how I felt in 1998, as a two-year-old who couldn't read. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, you often talk about the avatar the last airbender series on twitter and in your streams etc is that another series you'd like to make videos about in the future if you want to branch oh. away from uh game of thrones ooh, and ooh, ooh. song of ice and fire absolutely. stuff absolutely yeah i'd love to um i actually am currently planning working on um a video about the recent netflix adaptation of the last airbender what i think of that i heard it wasn't that good but i haven't seen it i was not blown away by it um but i i'm hoping to make that like a very good video, so it's going to take me a while. Well, that's something to look forward to, folks. Yeah. I haven't well, watched... I, I do think about Avatar quite a lot. It's a great show. I haven't watched it in a long time, but I watched it, like, when it was airing on, on TV back in the day as a child. And definitely, there was a stark difference between that show and everything else. I was very enamored with, yeah. with like, the, all the world building and everything. Even as a kid, you could definitely tell that there was something special to that program. I read the episode where he goes into the Avatar state for the first time and he like can't control it and it's this he's like destroying everything i was mystified by that one i remember that mm. i remember distinctly rushing home from school no not home i went to my friend harry's house where we were all gathering to watch the two hour long finale to avatar sozin's comet and it was like the, the event of the year great and then cora was cora happened I haven't seen that people like that don't they maybe it's a bit divisive um, i don't know yeah it's a little divisive 
I I think it's quite common for people to think it's not as good as The Last Airbender, but it's still, like, fine. Does a, a few weird things with the world building, but... And also, it was quite, um... It was bandied about by the network, so the showrunners were never sure exactly how long they'd be on the air for, so it was difficult to craft um, a long-lasting story. So that leads oh, to some pacing issues across the show. Yeah. It's it's kind of amazing that Avatar The Last Airbender got away with a lot of the subject matter it delved into for a kids' network. It was on Nickelodeon. Like, yeah. It's just like politics and war and it, dark stuff. It did stuff. feel strange um, <laughs> watching SpongeBob SquarePants and then this show about children living in a like fascist world where they have to fight for their own freedom and yeah. uh, like overcome the philosophy of existentialism. Um, <laughs> and, you know, oh, our mum died and we're going to confront the guy that killed her and, oh, I can't do it because he himself is dead inside and there's no humanity there to reclaim. Like, my God. And then, like, you know, there's a Rugrats, there's a Rugrats rerun next. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I remember watching the episode about, I think they're, they're sneaking into the Fire Nation and Aang goes to school and they're, like, altering history about what happened yeah there's a like, video about cultural historical revisionism <laughs> within avatar <laughs> what a, a show for what 10 a show. year olds i gotta rewatch that one of these days it totally stands up as an adult I imagine so well, I'd, i would love to see some avatar content on the gladys channel there's a lot yeah. to talk about there's heaps of stuff you could talk about character deep dives yeah, or um, themes overarching themes in the show yeah, I'm um so, so something that I struggle with is I don't want to create the video that someone else has already created and um Hello Future Me is already such a great video essayist um when it comes to Avatar the Last Airbender. Um but you know, that, that's a made up thing in my head. No one cares if I make a video on the same topic that someone else well, has already done. I mean, um, I'm, I'm sure you cover a lot of the same subject matter that other Game of Thrones YouTubers do, but you have your own style, your own way of expressing yeah, exactly. and humor that's, and everything. That's where the difference is. And yeah, I'm very eager to break out of the Game of Thrones niche because sure, House of the Dragon's doing well for now, but how long is this actually going to last? I have to think about the future. Should I pivot to Pokemon? You could give it a go. The Pokemon lore uh, stuff we were talking about, that could be an interesting topic yeah. or whatever interests you. <laughs> I think that, I mean, as a fan of yours, I think that there's a natural transition from Avatar is an obvious one because there's a lot of similar stuff mm. with the Song of Ice and Fire, with the well, the warring houses and politics. Many people have watched both, I imagine. I think um, at the core of both of the stories is the concept of choice for individuals. Yeah. So at, at least the original Avatar, the, I, I contend that the Netflix adaptation has just like completely abandoned that theme and most other themes. So that's unfortunate. It is unfortunate and is probably the thesis of whatever video I will make about it. Um, but yeah, I am keen to break out of the Game of Thrones niche, not just because, you know, I'm, I'm not bored of Game of Thrones and I don't think it's going anywhere, but I also have other passions as has been plainly discussed in this very installation of the fridge um and i think it'd be cool to share those with my audience and maybe they care maybe they don't that's fine you've done pivoting quite a bit across your youtube history haven't you believe it or not i used to be a maple story youtuber for a time <laughs> before i was a pokemon youtuber uh, but that was a whole drama because i was playing a perhaps a illicit server of the old version of the game that is good lord how scandalous is not allowed so i have went ahead and privated all those unfortunately but yeah I mean, you never know what's going to take off. When I was talking to False Swap Gaming, who was one of the biggest Pokemon creators, making Pokemon videos was not the only thing he tried. He was making melee, uh, Super Smash Bros. melee analysis videos, and he had other ideas too. But the, the video about Charizard that he made took off, so he just went with that, followed that thread, and here we are. I've done a similar thing. So I will say that Pokemon's probably like the, the thing I know most about, so it's easier for me to make videos about. Yeah. But I would love to branch out and do like movie analysis, talk sort of about the Song of Ice and Fire, maybe? House of the Dragon. Yeah, that'd be interesting. Yeah. Oh, it'd be, I could even have you on for a stream who knows um i would i would love to I, I think the idea of an audience who genuinely likes you um means that you can more easily make that switch whereas people who just chase the algorithm and you know they're getting views but they don't really cultivate a loyal audience when they pivot like it has to be along the wave of the algorithm and it's not really going to it doesn't it might not last. That's true. Chasing a trend or having good timing on a topic can be a good way to get your foot in the door and get one of your uploads noticed. But then you have to stand out and actually have like build an audience based on your own 
what yeah. you, unique stuff you bring to the table as a person and that's and that's precisely what happened to me with um game of thrones season eight is you know it, it was a viral trend to complain about game of thrones season eight but there are plenty of people who made videos about that who weren't able to turn that into a career and it's probably because their videos didn't stand out or they didn't have a unique style or way of saying things and you had a library of stuff as well so that you know a rising tide raises all ships or whatever yeah people probably went and back to gets, your old videos and... it just gets easier and easier each time because you know i make videos about house of the dragon season two people come to my channel and there's you know 70 odd videos that are already there about the thing that they've decided they're interested in this month it's all true so that's good he speaks truth, folks. I do think if you if you pivot, it's got to be tangential to what you do. And there's got to yeah, be a crossover. Yeah, you have to like leapfrog your way to where you want to go to. Because I made that video about um, analyzing the music of the Game of Thrones theme. And I did that so that in the future I could make videos about analyzing other music. music. Yeah. yeah. Like, I think a good idea for what I could do is videos about other competitive games that are like niche or interesting. Like there's this game called Tag Pro. It's this browser-based... Uh, very simple game where you it's literally just capture the flag and you play as a ball and you can just move That's literally it, but it's like really surprisingly <laughs> deep and there's like a competitive scene for it uh, My buddy plays it. He's one of the best in the world randomly I find it really interesting and there's there's well, a lot of yeah, like if it's not really if weird it's not too much for time commitment You might as well just make that video and see what happens I could, Yeah, the issue for me is that I take way too long to make my videos so that like trying experimenting with something like that is such a huge commitment for me. It's more of a risk. You don't know if people are gonna care. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. I can make Pokemon videos quite quickly just because I'm I'm a nerd and I've you know played this game for over a decade, so it comes easily. But branching out into it, I did it like I did try making a movie review once. I don't think it was very good, and I've now privated it. But yeah, when you when you try something new, it's like a it takes longer because you have you haven't built the muscle of like what how you structure that thing or. Mm. And then it's, it's a bit of opportunity cost because you could be making a video about the thing that people want to watch right now. You know what could be fun? If you want to pivot into uh, analyzing media such as movies, you could talk about the Pokemon movies like from the stance of a competitive player. Yeah, that's something people do. Like False Swipe Gaming did an analysis of Ash's team from the anime competitively. I saw that video because yeah. of course I did. Um, <laughs> But yeah, just like completely ignore the plot or, or the aesthetics of the film entirely and only talk about uh, the, the, the strategy employed by the Pokemon battles. That could be fun. I haven't watched the anime much, but I remember the Pokemon movie being good when I was a kid. The Surprise. first one. Yeah, yeah. The, the first one's great. Like there's that existential scene where Mewtwo talks about the meaning of life and all that. That's famous. It's foundational to Western philosophy, even though it's Japanese. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, no, that, that sounds like great content, like a Pokemon expert who doesn't know shit about the anime coming in and analyzing, like that, that's, that's gold it sitting be right fun. there. I feel like the comments will be furious at me. A lot of people love the anime, <laughs> but no, it could be fun anyway. It, that doesn't matter. Uh, circling back to the, the music point, uh, you're a musician and I actually listened to your EP a, a little bit ago. It was very good. Songs Before the Fall. Oh, thank you. Check that out, folks. Available now on all platforms. That's crazy. What drew you to music initially? And um, so m music came before any of these other things. Um, I don't recall a time before music. Both of my parents are musicians. My mother is a music teacher. I was a music teacher. I went to a music school for university and for high school. It's just been the always thing. It's the thing that makes sense to me. It's the way I think. And so it was just natural to write and produce, record, release music. And you've inserted that into your videos a little bit with occasional music analysis. And of course, the, the running gag and the bliss takes of the the 80s hit single as an intro replacing the the boring game of thrones intro that they copy pasted from the, the previous show yeah they couldn't be bothered they writing didn't a new do a new though. intro they just copied it that's kind of lame yeah actually just earlier today as we're recording this i released um heat of the moment these are up on my second channel glimbus how fun is that are you a you an 80s music enjoyer um, actually not so much as this catalog would have you believe i'm more into the 70s and late 60s like a stevie wonder Oh, I love Stevie Wonder. Marvin Songs Gay. in the Key of Life is so good. Absolutely. Um, more uh, like hard rock and that early metal scene like Led Zeppelin and Black Sabbath, Jethro Tull, classics. Wouldn't necessarily get that from the sound of your EP, which I thought was 
maybe a bit of like it reminded me of david bowie a little bit with the songwriting style Ooh, that's good to hear um yeah yeah that's definitely um there that's its own thing i'm thinking more about my band materia our stuff is certainly more geared towards uh that early metal sound well, that's cool he's in a band too folks check out his band materia as well and what what are what are some of your favorite australian musicians you I like uh, men love, at work yeah hell yeah <laughs> Um, yeah, they're great. Down Under is a bit ha- old hat. It's a bit overplayed. It's still a great song, though. I like it. And it's a it's fun. complete shame what happened to those guys. Do you know about that? What happened? I don't know. Uh, they got sued for um, copyright infringement over the flute solo in that song. You know how it goes? Oh, yeah, um, I did hear about that. The Kookaburra song. It's... Yeah, which had um, the, the rights to that old nursery rhyme had been acquired by some, you know, some conglomerate oh, controlled F-off. by a group what of lawyers. Hell? Yeah, and they were sued for copyright infringement and it did devastating things to those guys' lives. So that's very sad. Uh, great band, though. I really love um, Who Can It Be Now and Overkill. Great songs. But Absolutely. I think uh, my favorite Australian musicians, you know, Paul Kelly is a legend. I really love Jet. Uh, their album Get Born is uh, top tier. I would say you like, can never uh, miss with ACDC. That's the probably the most famous one. In excess, we're like the biggest band in the world for a little moment as well. We have some cultural impact, folks. We're yeah, not just a little... we we send our best sometimes. The Wiggles. <laughs> Honestly, the Biggle the Wiggles might be the biggest uh, musical act to come from Australia. Like it's Kylie Minogue and the Wiggles. Well, the, it's deserved. The Hot Potato is one of the greatest fruit songs salad. Of all time. Yummy, yummy. <laughs> when you're happy, you hear the music. When you're sad, you hear the lyrics. <laughs> you ever you choo choo uh, chugga chugga big, big red, red car oh, banger <laughs> it's pretty good children's media to, to be honest it's, it's a cut up of coco melon at least yeah oh and you know what I, maybe australians are just really good at producing children's media because the greatest children's show in a very long time is bluey oh yeah bluey's enormous did you hear that uh the majority of the revenue for ABC comes from Bluey merchandise now because they have the that merchandise rights for Bluey. Me. It makes more than like That's their great. actual... Uh, I might be wrong on that. Forgive me if I've gotten that incorrect. But I did hear that. Wait, the ABC receives more revenue from Bluey merchandise than it does from the taxpayer? I don't know about that, but I, it's a significant <laughs> amount. It's like billions or something. That's great. <laughs> did you also hear that... that Children in other countries are developing Australian accents because they're watching so much Bluey as children. It's about time. <laughs> the inverse happened here. So many here. kids here are speaking in, a, in American accents because we're so inundated we're, with American we're gonna media. We're going to have so... the civilization-style cultural victory because of Bluey. Yeah. We're going to spread, folks. <laughs> you ever heard the Avalanches? They're a good Australian band. The Avalanches. I have. Oh, God. How do I know the Avalanches? They did the... Frontier Psychiatrist they're, they're that, um, song. Yeah, they're um, that electro the electro dance guys, right? From like the early 2000s. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a genre called plunderphonics where everything is made from samples. I it's like a bit that, like but, instrumental hip hop. That's a cute portmanteau right there. How do you feel about Vegemite? Um, do you like Vegemite? Oh, Vegemite. I love Vegemite. You Are do? you kidding? Yeah, I start every day with two slices of buttered toast with a white <laughs> layer of vegemite adhered is that is that real it's mostly real not every day but most days i'm not too fond of vegemite i gotta be honest really it's a bit yucky un-australian i apologize uh hand in your boomerang and your <laughs> corked hat i just think it's a little it's a little odd that much of our national identity is associated with like a spread product <laughs> you know it's, it's a bit odd right i don't know well americans are mostly identified by marshmallow fluff so i don't think it's that out, out of the out of the ordinary that's, that's true it's our that's our claim to fame is veggie salty mites. black sludge that you put on australian toast for some reason. cuisine is is above the is above the rest i think fairy bread speaks more to what our culture is like than veggie might honestly true. do you folks know what fairy bread is that's a it's a piece of bread with the crust cut off with butter and sprinkles on it. A childhood delicacy for millions. I Supermarket. I'd loved it as a kid, bread. but I, I find it a bit gross conceptually. Oh, I, I couldn't adult. imagine eating it now. <laughs> as a kid, I was all on it. I was all, all about it. Yeah, it was huge as a kid. And of course, shapes. You can't go wrong with shapes. In any other country, if you ask someone what their favorite shape is, they're like, I don't like. I actually hexagon. honestly really enjoy shapes. I think they're a great snack. Yeah, they're great. S tier snack. OU snack. Can we expect some shapes content on the Gladys channel? 
<laughs> a review of each the alignment chart right. for each shape <laughs> oh yeah i was thinking of a tier list but an alignment chart works better i think because you sometimes you look at the the um, nacho cheese shapes and you're thinking man there's something there's something evil going on there it's got like an orange glow is that what the one yeah the best is the pizza i feel like barbecue it's, and it's... pizza taste the same to me, they don't taste the same because there's all there's like garlic and onion powder on the on the barbecue ones, but they, they occupy the same space for me. They fulfill the same function. It's it's I like having that. two two mons that accomplish the same role on a team. Whereas like you can't sub <laughs> out pizza shapes for you know cheddar cheese. Exactly. So it's like or uh, savory uh, shapes. Salamence and Dragonite in Gen Three. Exactly. They have a overlapping role. Or could it be Tyranitar and Aerodactyl more appropriately? Because one is better than the other. Because Dragonite's not that good, but barbecue shapes are quite <laughs> good, so I would give them more respect than to compare them to Dragonite. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. I got a question here from Bastard. <laughs> what classifies okay. as a horse Pokemon? I think Archaladon would fit into the horse society rather well. He has the stamina and heart of a horse. He was banned in OU as well for quite literally horsing around. Is this true? He was banned from OU and he was horsing around. But many Pokemon horse around. I don't think that's... I don't think that's enough to be quali to qualify as a horse. He's also... He's a bridge, if you didn't realize. Archaladon is a bridge Pokemon. Yeah. I'm just now meeting Archaladon for the first time and this is a bridge, but I'm, I, he could be a horse. I don't think Who's he has any he's... horse power, which is the most important factor in my opinion. Really? I think there are like real life horses that don't have any horse power. Are they no longer that horses? That doesn't make any sense to me. You, you got to have some horse power. Is it? What is horse power? <laughs> <laughs> just like how much, how powerful they are? Well, horse power is a measurement of, of work, isn't it? Of, um, of you know, uh, Yeah, like when exerted... the horse is walking around the windmill, not the windmill. Yeah, and the... that's why we measure car engines in horse power. So, like, uh, anything that moves, like, anything that can self-propulse has horsepower. See, that's controversial. So, I think <laughs> that you can't even use horsepower as a metric here because it's too encompassing. Maybe the whole institution of the Horse Council needs an upheaval because horsepower is the main, is the primary resource yeah, like, that they measure what, things what by. Is, what is the purpose of drawing these arbitrary lines in our society between horse and not horse? Why can't we all just be members of a, you know, coexisting polity? That's what you would think, but then the horse, they want to maintain their power structure, so they determine what well, is a horse, that, and that is the root of all the inequality. Yeah, I think that what needs to happen is that all, the, all of the mons designated as not horses need to unite in some way to overthrow... Then they would have this enough needs horsepower. to happen with the Dragon Council first, by the way. The Dragon Council is a bigger problem than the Horse Council. Well, who's a dragon? Because Gyarados is not a it, dragon, which is a point of contention. It's just as arbitrary. Because Kingdra's a dragon, but that's a seahorse, obviously. So I don't know how he's a dragon, but... I'm honestly with you there. I think that Kingdra has more of a claim to the Horse Council than to the Dragon <laughs> Council, even though he is a dragon type. There is no horse type in Pokemon. It's all topsy turvy. So we've got to, we have to iron this out and have clear. So I think Kingdra's rebellion is about to start, and then then all we're of these are going to have asterisks. But a horse usually has four legs. I'm saying usually so that Megago can still be a horse. He's a horse for sure. Yeah. We, we can't argue with that. So every qualification we make has to allow for Mag Cargo. All right. That's how we rewrite the history book. And, you know, Mag Cargo is very slow. So it has very low horsepower. But it learns the move high horsepower in the po the game. So that that's a then point in its it favor. why is it so slow? I don't know. If it has high <laughs> that's horsepower. kind of the whole joke of my thing is that why does Mag Cargo get high horsepower? <laughs> <laughs> like, what are they thinking with that? It doesn't make any damn sense. I but he does get it. So he has high horsepower. Being hilarious. That's so funny. <laughs> Whoever did that needs a raise. Yeah. Some people, they, they think that Pokemon has like logical consistency and stuff, but I don't know what they're talking about because there's so many things, little things that... Well, yeah, doesn't Wooper learn Ice Punch? What are we doing here? The kid doesn't I... have arms. Doesn't he? He's got a little... Maybe he doesn't have... I don't think he does now that I think about it. I thought that Nosepass didn't have arms, but he does have little arms. That was my bad. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in a technical sense... um. Only I can only think of one Pokemon that is a horse, like not a horse, but a horse, and that's Calyrex. Oh yeah, he's a horse. <laughs> therein lies the humor of the word a horse, because <laughs> you cannot know whether you're saying a horse or a horse, because they sound the same, folks. So how you either die a horse or live long enough to see yourself become <laughs> a horse. 
Ain't that the truth? <laughs> yeah, he's the only Pokemon who's a horse. So is he a member of the horse? No, he's not Glastria a horse. Glastria should be a member of the of the horse council. Yeah, there's a. There's is, some... is Glastria on the council? We don't know yet. There's more to be revealed, but he could be the horse I'm, elder. I'm partial to I'm partial to Glastria and um Gloom, Glamiao. Glastria is uh, fun actually. He's Glalie. pretty. He's pretty good now because he can trick room and uh, defeat the the big legendaries Maridon and stuff. He's a nice type. He's a cool guy. I do like Glastria. Oh, we not Glastria. The the Shadow Rider one. What's it called? Colorex Ice Rider, where he's riding on the Glastria. That's good. I think original yeah. Glastria sucks, unfortunately. Oh. Sorry to tell you. <laughs> he looks cool. He does look awesome. They did him dirty and by he's... giving him like 30 speed, even though he's a horse and he's probably yeah, pretty fast. Like that doesn't really make sense. Well, he's also a Glacier, so those are pretty slow. True. And he might be too heavy. Now, this is deep. This hey, is the deep discussion can, people came here for. This is good stuff. This is what can, we want. Can you answer a question for me? I was thinking about the logical consistency of the type chart, and I was wondering, you know how electric electric moves are strong against water types because water ad conducts electricity? Yeah. Why are steel types not weak to electricity? I don't know. <laughs> That's a good question. I, I think my honest answer is that the type chart does not have logical consistency. It's more... Yeah. It, I would say balanced, like they're more concerned about balance, but even then not really because like some types get screwed, like bug type just stinks. Everything resisted. Yeah. And, and so many ice. weaknesses. Yeah, and ice is tragic. I think that's such a shame. The type chart was more balanced pre-physical special split though, because at least like some types had a claim to fame in the sense that like they couldn't be attacked on the special side, which made them yeah. better in that role. Like uh, Regice has barely, the only type that is special that hits it super effectively is Fire. So therefore fire, Regice yeah. can actually function as a special wall pretty well in Gen 3. Yeah, that is interesting. Um, perhaps an unintended side effect of the physical special split. Yeah, probably not intentional, but... It... I did like it when the types represented like two different worlds of damage. They could have just committed to that and designed around it more and made it more logically consistent. Like there are yeah. little things like Shadow Ball being physical doesn't really make sense, but they could just make Shadow Ball a move that seems like, like make it Shadow Punch. Yeah, and, and the then... elemental punches being special. Yeah, I, I mean, you could kind of justify that. Like maybe it's imbued with elemental power as it punches or something. But yeah, it's, it's still yeah, you know. Like, I, I it's don't a think punch. any fans in the first three gens were like, "Well, Pokemon's great, but I can't play it because yeah. Fire Punch deals special damage." When I was when Gen damage. three was current, no one was complaining about it. You're right. It's true, but you know that's a whole debate, and people do overall like the physical special split. Yeah, and I guess it's like. You know, my Hitmonchan is useless because its special attack is garbage, but it has all of these special attacking punching moves. Well, you, you give it Hidden Power Bug, which is oh, a whole yeah? deal to get. <laughs> so like, simply get precisely 31 IVs in attack, 30 in special attack, 31 in defense, and keep resetting until you get that, and then you get Hidden Power Bug. Y yeah, I think that the casual player isn't going to encounter that. What do you mean? It's it's quite simple. <laughs> It's, it's, it, very, it's right there. <laughs> simply breed for 2,000 hours until you get the precise IV combination. I'll just click the correct buttons on Smogon. I really wish they just made it so hidden power... Because they get rid of hidden power. Why didn't they just make it so you could just set what type you wanted? Instead of this weird yeah. thing where it's tied to the... Anyway, that's that's neither Pokemon's here nor there, is it? special. <laughs> it's a goofy little franchise, isn't it? It's intriguing in many ways. I love how opaque so many of the very deep, intricate mechanics are. Like, trying to understand um, Pokeblocks in Gens 3 and 4 is... I never effed with all that. I, I think I didn't. Yeah. I just pressed the A button and hoped something was happening. <laughs> yeah, I'll get through the tutorial and then never pay attention to it, it again. Always, how interesting is it that this franchise with such wide appeal is also so archaic and complex in many ways? <laughs> what, a, what a concept. And, and contests as well. Every so often I'm like, man, I should learn how contests work. But then it's so crazy how much time and effort they put into these mechanics that most people don't give a single fuck about. True. I, d I don't understand contests to this day either. <laughs> I believe there's like people who do contests as their YouTube thing or something. <laughs> like That's crazy. And have you seen like uh, my buddy Elric C optimizing the battle factory? And getting like insane win streaks in that. That's a whole can of worms. Th that, is a, that is a grind. Yeah, and it's, it's difficult. People running Battle Frontier and Pokemon Emerald, like, that's it. They're on a different level. They are next level people. Evolution has produced <laughs> these people to be the next step. It is, it's fun to watch because he's got a spreadsheet of every set that the, 
that can be in the battle factory. And you can determine what they are by calculating. Like you do a certain amount of damage to this one, you know that it's this particular Tauros and it has this move set. And then you factor that into you. And then he knows how the AI works. So he knows that like in this situation, he wants to do this so I can exploit that and spam double team and win. And you have to optimize it because you can get screwed by RNG. Yeah, I've seen some of those videos. It's crazy. I'm into ROM hacks as well. All this Kaizo and run and bun nonsense. I played Kai. I did have some fun with Kaizo. I liked that I'm actually thinking a little bit about battle strategy in a Pokemon game for once. Yeah, it that's fun. that made it way more interesting than a casual playthrough of yeah. Emerald or something like that. You got to think about your because when you're an adult, it's for adults. It's Pokemon for adults because playing through Emerald or any other mainline game is mostly just like you get your moves and then you press A and then you're at the Elite Four. Yeah. In the new one, I think they even got rid of like the uh, the setting to turn off switch out after Pokemon KOs to make it even more. So you have to play on set mode? Yeah, I think. Forgive me if I'm wrong on that. So I think I saw that. I thought it was an option to like ha to be on hard mode. I don't know. What other games did you enjoy growing up? You, were, you probably had growing a Game up. Boy Advance, I imagine, and a Game Boy Color. I actually didn't. I oh. didn't have a Game Boy Advance. I did have a Game Boy Color. I had the special Pikachu edition Game Boy Color. Oh, hell yeah, it's a great one. Yeah, that was that was huge for me, honestly. Um, I didn't have a Game Boy Advance. I had to play Gen 3 on emulators, actually. But don't tell Nintendo or they'll get me. <laughs> um, growing up, I was really into... Um, we had a PlayStation 1, and my favorite games were the Spyro trilogy. I loved that that little guy. Those are classics. Yeah. So there was a great era for platformers back then. Sure. Absolutely. Did you ever play Banjo Croc on the PS1? That was Hell, a... I actually played it on um, on PC. Oh, me too, actually. But I think most people played on PS1. Yeah. Look at us. That's a, That Who'd game is has a surprising uh, can of worms behind. Yeah. Because a can of crocodiles? <laughs> Croc technically uh, predated Mario 64 and its technology, and I think was the first 3D platformer but it just got delayed a lot right and i think that um it's made by argonaut who is like who is a game dev and they worked on the original Star Fox for the snes so they were pioneers of like 3d technology right. yeah yeah yeah. i, I didn't um, know that and i think that I, I might be wrong on this but i think that croc was originally pitched as an idea to nintendo for a yoshi 3d platformer and then they declined it so he just they uh just wanted to make it themselves with their own ip and then mario 64 came out first before them like they rushed it out i don't know if they rushed it out but it came out first so Croc doesn't really get enough credit for being very innovative. Like it actually predated uh, Mario 64 in development. Crazy. No, I love both of those games to this day. Yeah, I think, I mean, um, I think Mario 64 probably the better game, but Croc is, is really cool. It's a great art style and music. And... Yeah, good vibes. I really, um, I got into Mario 64 speed runs oh, a you? long time ago, like like in 2012. I was watching Siglemic live streams I did that. while he was grinding I for world records. I did that a bit records. too, yeah. Gosh. And uh, Cheese when he was, yeah, he was coming up. Yeah, great fun that was. Um, I even watched... Uh, I was actually in uh, Narcissa Wright's stream when she did the um, 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 the first... There was some old Ocarina of Time strategy. I, I, the details escape me these days, but Something it was about monumental rocks, at the fall time. Down. Yeah, you have to that. hit the right rock at the right angle at the right time, and you slide backwards off the castle wall so you can hit the loading zone without having to do the escape sequence. And this is all moot now because you just teleport to the credits from the opening like location of the game. But back then it was huge. Speedrunning is a whole thing. Yeah. I got friends who speedrun. Yeah, One of my friends speedruns Final Fantasy, and those take like 10 hours. I don't know oh, how he does it. Who can do that? And it's uh, I tune in and it's 90 percent him skipping through dialogue <laughs> but uh there's much like pokemon there's a lot of surprising mechanical depth to those games too yeah um i, I watched the occasional worcester run oh yes i think it could be fun to maybe branch into pokemon speed running myself but yeah that's a whole thing why not i thought of um specking into hollow knight speed runs because that's one of my favorite games and it's just a new way to enjoy it you know yeah I never played that. I, I know I'd like it. It's the exact kind of thing I'd like, but I didn't haven't got around to playing that. Yeah, like my favorite genre of games is uh, Metroidvania, which it's like a fraught genre to talk about in any case. But, you know, games that um, constantly expand, expect you to go back, remember places, get new upgrades, um, grow personally, uh, confront your own demons and <laughs> like re remind you to call to your mother every so often. That sort of game, you know? <laughs> yeah. So Hollow Knight was really special for me in that way. Um, <laughs> my mum really liked that one. Great genre, for sure. Did you like uh, Symphony, uh, Symphony of the Night, the classic one? Yeah, of course. I love that game. 
Do you think you'd be interested um, in making any gaming-related videos on, on Gliders, or would that be ill-fitted? Maybe music well, analysis of game soundtracks? Perhaps? Yeah, that's one avenue I could explore. And uh, one of my first videos actually was a Crusader Kings 2 playthrough with the Game of Thrones mod, which oh, yeah. is like a monumental mod for a game. Like, th there are a few mods that are quite so uh, well thought out with, with such detail. And I'd like to try that. I've always wanted a good changes. Song of Ice so and Fire good. game, but there aren't, there aren't really any. Yeah, unfortunately Unfortunately, the gaming rights for this franchise have been woefully mismanaged. That sucks. So, like, they're mostly just printing out garbage um, mobile shovelware and slots games and that sort of crap. But yeah, everyone would love to see um, a well thought through open world, maybe RPG sort of game for Ice and Fire. Like that, that, that would automatically slap, right? Yeah, get get whoever made Morrowind, get them back. <laughs> they could do that. They'll they'll do Does it. Does anyone good. remember the guys who made Morrowind? What happened to them? Well, it was Bethesda, obviously. I mean, like the original <laughs> team or whatever. Just get find yeah. find the original fellas who made that good. Or even um The Witcher Three, get those folks on in on it. Who were they? CD Project. <laughs> yeah. They're probably busy, though. I did have this, like, pipe dream of an idea for a video where I play through literally every Game of Thrones licensed game and discuss each of them and then die. That would be a good video, but that sounds time-consuming. I, I well, remember one I take too long. where you, like, play as Jon Snow in the Night's Watch. And you do quests and it looks pretty bad. I haven't seen I don't remember. Yeah, that's the RPG from, like, 2011 or something. I'm yet to play that one. But, yeah, um... I do want to do some gamey stuff because I like games and I want my YouTube channel to be not just a place about Game of Thrones, but a place about everything that I like. It's a, it's it's mine, damn it. People come to listen yeah. to me talk about whatever I'm thinking about. Well, a lot of games have interesting world building and themes and stuff. Yeah, another about. avenue that I could exploit is to talk about George's involvement in Elden Ring. The author of Game of Thrones did lore building for That's... Elden Ring. So, like, why not discuss that? Yeah. I feel like I might have some useful insight. I've heard that it's dubious how much he actually contributed, but... Uh... That is interesting that he apparently helped with that. Well, yeah, I feel like I could be the judge of that. <laughs> Probably, yeah. If not, it would still be a fun thing to do. I would love to do similar videos about, like, games with actual good stories. Like, you ever played Deus Ex? That's one of my favorite games. I actually haven't played it, but I've watched the H-Bomber guy video. Oh, yes, he did a video about the human revolution Yeah, and comparing it to the original. And I watched it having not played any of the games, because that's what you do on he, YouTube. He does a good job explaining what's so, so good about it. But there's a lot to talk about in that, and a lot of it is very, like, prophetic. Like, it's a great work of sci-fi. In, yeah. In the... In that game, there was a, a disease similar to COVID and drama about who gets the vaccine and who doesn't, which felt pretty like relevant to recent Prescient. times. Yeah, he's got um he, he's handled his YouTube channel very well, where like he could upload anything that he's been thinking about, and people would just be on board for it. He's such an interesting channel. He's yeah. like the, the anti YouTuber because <laughs> you know the conventional wisdom is you got to upload frequently and like. With a consistent uh, thumbnail style and there's, there's all this conventional wisdom but he, he'll just drop at a complete random moment like a four hour deep dive into the the most obscure topic you've ever heard of and well, it's like yeah, a so fantastic video if that a... conventional wisdom is to get you in like as a part of the thing that everyone's talking about right it's to get you on the wave whereas what he and other people in his position can do is make the wave like, instead of jumping on the thing that everyone's talking about, H. Bomber Guy tells us what we're going to talk about. I suppose that's true, but it's, it's interesting. How do you even get to that point? I guess he just earned it from years of high-quality videos and, like, earning that uh, that trust yeah, in his exactly. audience where whenever he uploads, it's going to be... It's an event. You know, Alt-Shift-X almost has that sort of sway because, I don't know if you know this, but All Tomorrow is that video he made about C.M. Kozeman's science fiction... Like, I, I love that art, video, art yeah, seen that video. It's one of his best videos. It, it's so good. Um, and and it, it rightfully has a shit ton of views. No one was talking about All Tomorrow's prior to that. Like, there was literally, like, no discussion about All Tomorrow's. And now it has a massive fan base. So, like, single-handedly, that video created a sphere of discussion. That's interesting, yeah. And that's a great example, back to the point of, like, branching out into other things. That's It feels very similar to his Song of Ice and Fire analysis videos, where there's all this lore to analyze and all this... A lot to say about it and it was really interesting and i'd never heard of it but i guess he's yeah, developed no trust with his audience it was like i'm yeah i think this is interesting and worth talking about and we trust that it is 
Something that I reflect on relatively frequently is that all of my best performing videos are things that nobody asked me to make. They are things that I decided I needed to talk about. So, yeah, you sure. know, it, it's great to like get the audience interaction so that I can have an idea for, you know, the next little thing to push the channel along, to occupy time, to feed the algorithm a little bit. But all of the like monumental things, all the things that actually progress my career, that move the channel in a, into a different place, they're things that no one told me to make. No one told me to rank every episode of Game of Thrones, and that got me 3 million views. I think that was the first video I saw from you that was popping up in my algorithm. Makes sense. In the piss take thing, it's a brilliant idea that stood out from other channels as well. Is it really that brilliant? Is it really I, that I mean, groundbreaking to, to be <laughs> silly while, while explaining why something's bad? I, I suppose not, not really, but it's... <laughs> You don't have to reinvent the wheel, I guess. It, no one else was doing that kind of thing. And I guess I do have a specific flavor of video. Yeah, you've done a great job standing out from the crowd in your niche, I would say. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Shucks. And, you know, you, you bringing that style of presentation to this sort of um, competitive Pokemon thing is its own, uh, like, carving out of a space in the market. It's... I agree with you that it's, like, never planned because like, the whole Iron Mugulus was a stupid... <laughs> it's a mashup of some Google images that I made as a stupid joke, and it has become something far greater than I ever could have imagined. And people think that Iron Jugulus is the fake Pokemon. who He's the real Pokemon, but Iron Mugulus is, a, is actually a future form of the cup Pokemon. <laughs> so I've confused everybody. I've created, a, I've made a cultural mark a little bit somehow. This is your It's bizarre. Horse. It, it kind of is. <laughs> the, the, the thing of me making little storylines in my videos is just out of like... I have a compulsion to do that kind of thing. When I made Maple Story videos, I did the same thing. Where, you know, in Ma Maple Story is a simple game. You're grinding, you're trying to get good items. I just get bored after a while. I'm like, oh, let me spice it up. Let me add like some NPC is in charge of. I don't know. I had this whole storyline in Maple Story too. I'm just a weirdo. I <laughs> you heard it invent, here first, folks. Invent stories where they shouldn't exist. And uh, that's. It. <laughs> We always refer to Pokemon as he or she when, you know, most of them can could be either gender. So, like, that sort of... Um, no, I, I just... If I say he, I'm declaring it as, as the, that gender. I'm setting oh, the canon. Right. King Dre no. is always a dude. No, just kidding. But you, you know what I mean? Like, you're anthropomorphizing, you're personifying the Pokemon. Yeah, I'm treating them as one individual. And, <laughs> so many of your videos are actually about the character of each Pokemon. I suppose you're right, yeah. That's how I think of them. I don't think of them as a species. I think of them as one entity in my head. And I guess that comes across <laughs> in the way I talk about them and describe them. I'm like, he's a good bloke. And he, like, Swampert is a reliable teammate. He'll always guy's do you right. I'm not thinking about there's multiple Swampets. He's the Swampet. Yeah, we're he's... talking about the Swampet. <laughs> Swampet, he's this guy we know That's... and we're going to talk about why we like him. It comes from the fact that I'm not as connected to the single player side. I think about all that. Because in competitive, Swampet is one thing. Yeah. He's just Swampet. Whereas there's a couple of different, I don't know, um, what's something that would have lots of different sets that you can never expect one of. Uh, like Jirachi or Gengar. Yeah. Like, in your head, is is Gengar one guy or is he a couple of different guys? Or is he one guy he's who a jack could of all show trains. up wearing he's a different got, hat? He's got different tools and you never, you never know what he's going to do. He's a sneaky fellow. He's got that grin on his face because he knows he, that you don't know what he's going to do. <laughs> and he, he revels in that it almost fits with his his visual presentation the way Absolutely. he plays in the game i always enjoy that when there's a there's a harmony between the the design and the flavor of the pokemon and how they actually are used in game how much do you think game freak actually thinks about how things are going to play out in the competitive scene not much i think uh yeah gen 3 being good competitively was probably mostly an accident <laughs> similar to melee that's why i compared it to uh, melee because that was never designed to be a competitive game but i think yeah, that, that kind of thing spawns naturally from uh like passionate people putting all their energy into it because melee was a very uh it's a great game all around you know and like little quirks about the engine and the way characters move is all very like there was a lot of thought put into all of that and that resulted in a good competitive game that evolved on its own i would say the same about gen 3 where i think every gen 3 pokemon design is like distinct and they all do something unique and then but also nothing is so overturned that it's like dominating and 
uh, restricting variety in what can be used. So yeah. the fact that they probably thought about that in the design process, like they don't want to give this Pokemon every tool. They want it to have these pros and cons. And but you still want to like give the player powerful tools, and, like rewards for completing the story and getting yeah, the and that's where the, like the know? legendaries come in and stuff, where they're obviously more powerful than anything else. And but also the pseudo so legendaries as well are, are supposed to be more powerful than other things. But yeah, they're a reward for being like super fans of the series and showing up to these silly little events. Yeah, but then you look at a design of a Pokemon like Roselia, who is not meant to be like an end game Pokemon. But it has like this little niche and competitive because they took the time to give it unique tools that stand out from everything else. Even Resilient. Yeah. Like that's that's what I like about Gen 3. Yeah. I see some YouTubers talking about, you know, how, how Game Freak like certainly uh, made this decision to make the competitive scene play out in a certain way. No, they way. don't and think I'm... about competitive. <laughs> they don't. No, but they, they, don't. they, they don't. think about things that result in good competitive yeah. gameplay. Like Natural. they're thinking about giving every little Pokemon its own little flair and like balance things in, in the game do you and think that every pokemon is someone's favorite yeah lore of large numbers and every time i make a video ranking pokemon and i have one at the bottom i get furious comments from people that are like no he's my favorite and it's some lame pokemon like do you know inteleon <laughs> yeah i ranked him as the worst whoa, starter in the whoa, game you didn't call inteleon lame did you my I, favorite guy I, I, i'm sorry inteleon nation but i <laughs> i ranked him as the worst starter in the series i thought he was just lame and he's like weird he's got long legs and he's standing upright i think inteleon like... um he, he doesn't really carve his own space as a starter like he doesn't yeah, he's have outclassed a by like identity. every water type even starmie from gen one just outclasses him right like his thing is that he has high crit chance, which is, I don't think that's interesting, in my opinion. I've never seen his Gigantamax form before. That's sort of uh, quirky. Yeah, I consider Gigantamax to be a fake uh, <laughs> yeah. fever dream. That's a fake mechanic. I never liked it. What if Pokemon could become large? <laughs> <laughs> what if some Pokemon could expand? That's genius. What other uh, TV shows have you enjoyed besides, obviously, Game of Thrones? You watched anything um, recently that's cool? On well, House of the Dragon too? Six, Succession was really good. I enjoyed that too, yeah. A bit different to what I, I usually watch. About, yeah, yeah. What do you usually watch? Bluey? Yeah, I'm a Bluey fanatic. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I've I've seen like The Soprano, all the classic TV shows, you know, The Sopranos, Breaking Bad, Better Call Saul. A Succession was talked about in the same vein, but it's very different in its style. It's not sad. Uh, it stands out a lot compared to other like prestige TV, I reckon. Yeah. So it was a bit of a change of pace for me that I appreciated. Yeah, I really liked that. Um, I actually watch a lot of YouTube come to, like, if you would believe that. And I have to like find time to watch TV, which is crazy. We live in a crazy world where I have to take a break from watching YouTube videos <laughs> to it is, it's, it's watch TV. It. Yeah. Um, I just finished a rewatch of Arrested Development. I love a good sitcom. I, I hate a bad sitcom, but I love a good sitcom, you know? That's, that's very sensible. Like, um, maybe good and bad are the wrong words. They're like creative, uh, witty, re re sitcoms that respect your audience, like the Archer and Community. Yeah, I liked Community. I rewatched it and pretty Ricky recently. Morty, which you really need to be smart to understand. Yeah, like the show respects the viewer's intelligence with all of its dick and fart jokes. Rick and Morty is, <laughs> is interesting. I was into it for a time. I haven't watched it I think it's it uh, definitely dipped in quality, though, at a point. It was certainly a cultural moment. It did make... It, it probably started the trend of multiverses and everything. I think that was probably Rick and Morty that did that. Or a part of it, which has gotten a bit I annoying. Think that's, yeah, that's mostly annoying. And honestly, not that clever. Yeah, it's not that original, but at the time, I guess it was novel for most people. Yeah. And it stood out a little bit. I took a look at Smiling Friends recently. I had never took, checked that out before, but finally got around to it. I haven't That's... watched the second season yet, but I really enjoyed the first one. Feels very, like, classic. Uh, it's was well, made by the Newgrounds animators. Yeah. So it's got that classic YouTube feel to it, which I appreciate. And a bit of classic Adult Swim as well. Yeah, lots of fun. Wacky, bombastic. Honestly, crazy. Good old-fashioned surreal humor. Fucks, you can't yeah. go wrong. What do you watch on YouTube usually? Um, well, there's a massive backlog of Jimothy Cool videos that I've oh, got to work mate. through. I know. He's right. Um, I don't know. I used to be really vigilante about um, keeping up with my subscriptions feed. Like I would go to the subs box every day and yep, I've got to work through that. But these days I just mostly... Get, uh, the algorithm throws videos at you and you're like, yep, those will do. 
That's a big change in how YouTube worked. It used to be That's very true. subscriptions based. I used to and even days... directly go to people's channels and just see what they've uploaded. I don't really do that anymore. Yeah, I, sometimes I do that when I come across a new channel that I like. But mm. yeah, it's it's big change how these days subscriptions don't matter all that much. But still like and subscribe to this video. Yeah, subscribe to the fruit. I feel like if you subscribe, you get more of their videos in your algorithm though. Probably. I think Anecdotally. it's more a, um, a factor of interaction more than just subscribing because the um, mm, channels i yeah. watch but i'm not subscribed to that are still recommended to me all the time probably is more about watching that's the biggest factor in the algorithm yeah, there's no, no specific channels know. you follow you just kind of just uh yeah like this looks interesting i'll check this out these days i can't really like there's no main thing that i'm watching <laughs> it's a massive mm. Uh, just random pile of uh, music stuff, game stuff, media analysis stuff, and the occasional like original YouTube stuff. Like I watch um Geo Wizard straight line missions across certain countries. Are you aware of that? I know Geo Wizard. I don't know about that specific thing, but he's great. Really, I haven't seen him cross Wales in a straight line. I haven't seen it. I'll check it out after oh, this. <laughs> God. Great, great series. I've got something to do today. I'll check that out. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I'm also into, you know, animals. I like taxonomy. That's another thing that I bring up, pr like, with some frequency oh, in my that's videos. Interesting. Oh, yeah, you um, did. So... In, in the streams, you talk about that sometimes. What were you talking yeah. about? Like, the taxonomy of some fish <laughs> in, in one of them. Oh, in the food description video, probably. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but I, I use taxonomy mostly as a vector to, well, actually, people, because it's such a weird... Um, it's like the, a categorization of something that inherently resists categorization. That's why it's so interesting to me because it's just humans trying to put animals in boxes when it, it's nature, man. Nature ain't going to fit into boxes. How does Macago fit into all that? He's a horse. Ah. <laughs> well, it, it's interesting because snails are gastropods, which are mollusks, which are like very far removed from all vertebrates and mammals. And, and, so, and then they gave us the move like high horses. horsepower, which was an interesting <laughs> choice, wasn't it? Yeah. Well, technically, actually, slug learns high horsepower, and it can evolve into Macago. So Macago doesn't learn oh. it, but, the, but that makes even less sense because slug is a, is a maybe slug. Maybe high horsepower is like the, it converts its energy loss due to heat into kinetic energy, and that's how it's able to exert such high horsepower. Right. <laughs> but can't help but just think of the speed stat and how could he have the agility to achieve that that re i feel like that would require energy on his part that he doesn't have well no slugma and magcargo are very energetic it's just that most of that energy is in heat loss from being made of oh. lava slash magma so i think what happens is that momentarily they're able to switch off that heat loss and harness that power and convert it into kinetic physical power i think you've just solved this and mystery real hard yeah you know what so they say about I, like storytelling you're not supposed to spell everything out you got to leave some mistake but you've just ruined yeah. one of my greatest mysteries of well, why sorry, does Macargo learn high horsepower you could have just said you didn't know but now <laughs> I'm just going to have to spell it out. Here's why. Macargo Lord's High House Spell. Here's why. That's my next upload. You pressed the issue. <laughs> I but did. I think it's quite resonant because this means that Magcargo isn't always a horse. It means that it can momentarily be a horse. If the definition of horse is tied to how much horsepower you generate, which at the moment it is by the decree of the horse council. So did that you know adds that um, a donkey power is one third of a horsepower? Really? Yeah. I didn't know that. Thank you for the information. Actually, I don't know if I've made that up. It, I, I might be misremembering. <laughs> donkeys have their own power. Why didn't they just? Why don't they just use the horsepower standard? They made a new metric for donkeys. Uh, well, Maybe that's useful for some people. Donkey has. Yeah, well, they didn't make like car power when the when cars came out. They still using horsepower. I thought horses were the standard of power. Oh, that's true. Well, I think it was because they wanted to like distinguish each car from the other by telling you how many horses it was worth. Yeah. So then, but. <laughs> uh, when donkeys came on the scene, <laughs> they thought uh, it was confusing if it's like a decimal point of horsepower. So do you think Mudbray has one third the power of, uh, I don't know, Ponyta? People keep telling me Mudsdale is not a horse, and I don't know what they're talking about, because that's a horse, right? If you if you look at it. But Mudbray is the it, it's, previous It's the form. draft horse Pokemon. It's a, it's a horse. People are crazy. But it evolves from Mudbray, which is a donkey. But then that would make him a small horse or a pony rather than a don don donkey if he evolves into a horse. Or maybe evolution well, in Pokemon what I'm transforms getting at is, you. I think that Mudsdale is actually a mule, which is still a horse, but it's also a donkey. Oh, yes. Okay. Well, now we're getting somewhere.
Well, is po- Ponita maybe doesn't have a claim either. It's a pony. But that's also that's pony. a horse. Ponies are horses. If yes. seahorses are horses, ponies are horses. And I would, it's contentious what the seahorses are. I have decided that seahorses are horses. Okay. So don't worry. I've, I've done I'll that for you. I'll add that to the wiki. And we'll we'll say that's the law. Sea lions are lion. Is there a lion council? There could be, but there's not that many lion Pokemon. There could be Entei and Pyro and well, Seal and Dugong because they're sea lions. They're sea lions. They could ally ally and have their own little. But why must we? Why must they group based on their species and not the like content of their character? You know, <laughs> like it's it's a bit. Well, go like, on then. What what sorts of. Uh, councils can we make by grouping <laughs> Pokemon by the content of their character? Well, I, that's what I can respected like a, about the horse council fellow? was that anyone could become a horse due to it tied to horse power. It, it, it's not as it's not so taxonomically strict. It's about it's a meritocracy. So I am a cargo through hard work and dedication became a horse in name. Right. And horsey wants to undermine this, clinging to the legal definition of of horse by an outdated metric and archaic system. God, it benefits that the, the higher ups and not the newcomers that want to make a name for themselves, and it's ridiculous. I, I think it's quite brave of Horsey to be splitting hairs when it comes to who's a horse, because as soon as like Horsey's the next one to go, right? Correct. <laughs> Unless you have anything to say about it, but well, I I I I will give you that of the horses, Horsey is the least Horsey. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can't argue with that. Because there are degrees of horse. It's not just like an, a binary on and off thing. You're not just a, a horse or not a horse. There are. It's a spectrum. Or you're a horse. Of horsiness. Much. Or you're you know a h o r s e, which is a different thing. But and I mean this discussion could go on for hours. <laughs> it, it has. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps we should cut our losses before we we get into some serious heated d- debates because this is crazy. This is crazy. But. I always thought that Rapidash was a skinny cow, but I guess we'll just power through that. That's just nonsense. That's if anything's a horse, I think Rapidash is a horse. We have to. That's like the the lawful good in terms of not moral alignment, but horse status. Rapidash has to be, otherwise everything crumbles. I don't know. It's got a, it's got a horn, and horses don't have horns. They're also not on fire most of the time. So it's a unicorn, which. It's just a horse with a horn on it. Really, unicorns have a more complicated position in that in traditional mythology. But I'll I'll give you that most of the time it's just a horse with a horn. In the Pokemon universe, I'll say that's the case. I don't think. I think the pro- Keldeo might be even more. Oh no, it has a horn as well, doesn't it? That's a. I'd say he's a horse. Keldeo is a horse as much as Rapidash is a horse. I'd say that we can agree on. He's got hooves on him. Is Palkia a horse? Is Dialga a horse? They can become horse in the origin form. You seen the origin form? Yeah. 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 So, like Meg Cargo, Dialga and Palkia can become horses. They they can do so more in a more literal sense. I guess for Cargo's horse status, it's contingent on a uh, different metric <laughs> that is harder to d- define concretely. But Palkia can directly become a, an actual horse, which is interesting, <laughs> to say the least. I think that Dialga looks pretty horse-like most of the time anyway. Yeah, he's four-legged with... You could mount him. And yeah, exactly. Ride on the king's road, and, <laughs> <laughs> and it might be a bit large though. Maybe. Uh, well, he's a dragon, isn't he? He's battle. a dragon. Oh, is he a dragon and a horse? Like he's a Kendra? dragon. He's a dragon type, and he. You know what? There's a the dragon horse conglomerate. They got a new member. We've we've solved that. If that was a if problem to solve in the first place. Both Palkia and Dialga are horses. It makes me wonder about Giratina. Giratina's origin form is more of a Lovecraftian beast rather than a horse. Have you been like up close at a horse's face at any time recently? Because they also are a bit Lovecraftian. I think I think I've ridden a horse before, but I can't remember. I think I've seen a horse up close. Did it make you question your place in the universe? Because if so, that's Lovecraftian. I don't think it did. Do, I think I, it was just a horse, but <laughs> next Giratina time... Giratina has six legs, which makes me think it's some sort of insect, actually. That's a creature beyond our understanding. Yeah. So, cool Pokemon, by the way, actually. I like Giratina. Ghost Dragon, that's sick. Very cool. Anyway, Glidus, perhaps we should wrap things up, because yeah, we're it, getting it, to absurd it territory. Though, it appears as though we could go on forever, <laughs> which is a thing I'm known for doing. And, we, and it would go nowhere, and nothing would be gained. <laughs> And for what? But thank you very much for coming on the fridge. And thanks for asking me on. I hope that you find more pokey tubers to talk to instead of random. Honestly, like I'd me. like to talk to other YouTubers that aren't pokey tubers as well. We're an interesting bunch, aren't we? The Game of Thrones world, absolutely.
but it's a it's a crossover that the people they've been clamoring for it they've been begging for this and, one and i'm sure they loved it thank you i had and... so many messages asking when i was going to go on the fridge with jimothy cool and here it is and he delivers and happy to collaborate with you at any time if you have any ideas perhaps a pokemon alignment chart could actually be a funny idea or some that kind of be funny. pokemon game of thrones style uh crossover whatever i don't know how that's possible but it could be and that would i'm sure the comments will be full of suggestions and i'm all ears <laughs> thank you very much again and i'll catch you later take care